All right, we are at the top of the hour now. I will now start the webinar. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I will give you just a few moments to get logged in and settled, and then we will get started. Okay, looking good. Well, hello again, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Mai, and I will be one of your webinar hosts. Um, right now, you can test your audio by um, clicking auto settings to make sure you can hear us. And everyone has been muted. So if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box located on the menu bar to ask questions. And to turn on and off the transcripts, you can click on the CC icon on the menu bar and then click show or hide transcripts. We are also offering CPE today and in CPE and attendance credit today. And in order to receive credit, you must be individually registered and logged into your own device. Group viewing will not count for CPE and you must stay connected to the training the entire time in order to earn CPE. And you must answer the CPE polling questions that you see appear on your screen. And CPE certificates will be emailed out to participants within 10 to 14 business days after this training. And with that, I would like to introduce one of our first presenters today, Ksenia. All right, thank you. Uh, we will get started. So my name is Ksenia Popke. I'm a partner in charge of the Intermountain region of our not-for-profit practice at I Bailey. I will be your facilitator for today and monitor the Q&A for our speakers. And if we don't get to all the questions that come in, um, each presenter's contact information is available in the slides. So please don't hesitate to reach out. But also, uh, you could reach out uh, to me as well on the All Things Not For Profit. I currently serve as part of the AACPA and FASB Not For Profit Council and surely can find you an answer, uh, you know, whether it's within our firm or nationwide, uh, but we'll try to help you out. And a couple of housekeeping moments, like my mentioned, there will be polling questions about three or four per presenter. We're not going to be taking any scheduled breaks. So the polling questions are spaced out pretty evenly. So just watch those and um, take your time as needed. Uh, presenting alongside I Bailey are two of our wonderful partners and leaders in their respective fields. Uh, from the investing and fundraising side, Innovest and Amphil. And you'll hear from Stephen and Ben later on during the presentation as they discuss the strategies for mission aligned uh, investing and fundraising. But first of all, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Colette, uh, who will provide an overview of the latest developments in the climate economy and the energy tax credits. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um... So the climate economy and energy credits. And so as you can see, this is a lot to take in, um, but the Inflation Reduction Act um, is yet another investment by the federal government in building out our climate economy and um, in clean energy infrastructure. We're not gonna go through all of this today as it, but really focus in those items that pertain to nonprofits. So as you can see with the Inflation Reduction Act, there were several credits and uh, <clears throat> several credits and incentives um, across the board that um, were either expanded, modified, or even provided new ones. And so you might be thinking, why do you care about tax credits? And I'll get to that in a minute. But we also had two new tax code sections that essentially allowed nonprofits to partake in some of these incentives. So we'll focus on the ones that we're seeing primarily in the nonprofit space and then walk through how, um, how you go about monetizing them. So with that, first polling question, do you have new construction or major capital improvements earmarked for the next 10 years? Yes, no, maybe trying to find the, fun the funding. Okay, we have that up. 
Colette, let me know when you are ready for results. And so a lot of um, the incentives that are going along with this Inflation Reduction Act are just different energy efficient or alternative energy sources that are going in. And so if you're partaking in those, which we'll get to in a second, um, there could be um, cash available to help either fund those um, or other aspects of, of the organization. So I don't know, May, if we're at 80, 90% of responses, I can't see that, but. Yes, yeah, we are good. And Perfect. are you ready for results? Sure. There you go. Nice, so pretty evenly distributed. Um, you know, we've got 40% yes, and then another 23% maybe, um, and then the remaining not going into it. So something to think about if your, you know, capital improvements plans changes um, as we as we move forward. So let's see. with that, we'll talk about these investment tax credits. Section 48, oh, sorry. Section 48 is an investment tax credit. It's been around for 40 plus years on the for-profit side. And with the Inflation Reduction Act, it really opened it up for nonprofits to take advantage of. So as part of your capital improvement, um, <clears throat> your capital improvements, if you are investing in equipment that produces energy from alternative sources, you could be eligible for this tax credit. Um, and so, and I'll get into this a little bit later, but with those new code sections, tax exempt organizations or nonprofits are able to make an election that essentially turns these credits into rebates. And I'll go through the mechanics of that later. Um, however, in writing the code, they didn't wanna write a separate set of tax code sections for this credit. And so for-profit and not-for-profit alike are well contained within 48. So um, the alternative or the equipment that we're looking at is either sole wind. We've actually seen some improvements in smaller wind turbines, usually combined with the solar component on buildings. Um, we've seen a lot of geothermal. Um, for example, we've, um, you know, there was a church and school that was upgrading their HVAC system and they were gonna go natural gas. And one of their parishioners actually works for Ed Bailey and heard a lot about these energy credits. So in working with them, we determined that it was gonna be another, the whole HVAC renovation was gonna be about $4 million um, to, to upgrade. With the geothermal well being added, it was another $800,000. However, because we've got this geothermal well that's producing um, this alternative energy, they're eligible for essentially a $1.2 million credit or rebate back once the system's placed in service. So it more than, it more than covers um, the increased costs. And then, you know, the church and the school netted about 400,000, will, will net about $400,000 to further their mission. So some of these can be heavily incentivized, um, you know, not even considering the energy savings that that the school and the church will benefit from for years to come. So we've seen a lot of geothermal um, micro turbines and combined heat and power systems. Usually we see those on an industrial scale, but if you're implementing equipment that recovers waste energy, um, or even implementing an energy storage component, such as a battery, which we typically see combined alongside one of the other energy properties. It doesn't have to be. Um, biogas, microgrid controllers, and electrochromic glass. So we've seen the microgrid controllers, um, once again, in connection with maybe a, a storage component as well as solar. Um, but, you know, there are counties in California that are looking to update several of their buildings to help manage their utilities and their electricity um, because California doesn't have the most reliable grid system. And so they're looking for ways to keep the lights on and reducing their overall utility cost um, by looking at these microgrid systems. The electrochromic glass is... Um, 
The electrochromic glass is the glass when the sun hits it, it fogs up. And so it reduces the need for window treatments, but also aids in the energy efficiency of the building itself. Um, and so we've seen that evaluated actually um, here in Denver, there's a dance company downtown that's going through a big remodel. And so they're evaluating this. And when they were looking at, you know, preliminary bids and costs, it looks like with the increased cost of the glass, they'll still net about $300,000 um, with their incentive coming back to them. So it is definitely a modeling exercise when you're in those early design phase. If there is a way you can just ask either your energy modeler or your contractor if they've evaluated any of these and what's a rough estimate, um, we can do kind of that modeling exercise to figure out what that's going to look like. Now, how do we go about it? The way the credit works, is it's twofold. One, we have to determine the cost, and I'll get into that in a second. And the other is what our credit percentage is. So baseline credit, you do nothing else. You take 6% of the cost identified. Now, if you're paying or subject to prevailing wage and apprenticeship rules under Davis-Bacon, which has typically been a federal government requirement, um, or California government requirement, um, but basically paying base uh, union labor rates and having qualified apprenticeships on the project, then that 6% increases to 30%. Now there are two exceptions to this rule. Um, one being if this energy property that is implemented has a maximum net output of less than one megawatt, then you're automatically deemed to have met this 30%. On a similar note, if construction started prior to January 29th, 2023, you're also deemed to have met the wage requirement and you get that 30%. So if you have items that are already underway, um, just because you started construction prior to 2023 doesn't mean that um, you're ineligible because beginning of construction gets your foot in the door, right? Whereas once you place that in service, that's when you'll be eligible to go and claim um, these credit rebate, uh, rebates back. Now, once we get to 30%, if we're able to find domestically sourced energy property, we get another 10%. Those rules closely follow the Buy America Act. Um, we did receive additional guidance there, but um, we've still got more questions. And I'll get into some of these bonuses a little, in a little bit more detail um, in the next slide. And then the next one are energy communities. So if you're in an energy community, um, you get another 10%. That one's a little bit easier to determine. There's a map, you either are in or you're out. Um, now there are additional bonuses for solar and wind with an environmental justice allocation. Um, and I'll go into that detail as well. And so those additional bonuses can be either another 10 to 20%. So if your cards fall the right way, you can get close to 70% of the cost identified with this property back as essentially a rebate from the federal government. Um, now I did say, you know, one is determining where our percentage is, but two, the other side of it is really figuring out what our cost basis is. And in the for-profit world, there are a lot of rules that identify what exactly is our tax basis in these properties. Um, and so it's not just the invoice for the solar. Um, there are actually some 40 year old definitional rules under 48 that start talking about, you know, the interconnected property. If the building's able to say, produce all of the thermal energy from the geothermal system, then we get to include some of the ductwork and the piping and additional systems get pulled in because of this qualified property. So it's, it's twofold process, right? We've got to figure out what costs are attributable and to really maximize that cost base that we would then apply our percentage to. All right, so these bonus amounts. Um, we've received, Treasury has been working pretty hard. We've received lots of guidance over the summer, which answered several questions, but also created a few more. Um, and so we'll go into those details um, in a bit, but just if you're having trouble sleeping here at the citations, that might be helpful to read more on. So first I'll go into the prevailing wage and apprenticeship rules. Those in the government space um, are just, are kind of 
cringing right now hearing Davis Bacon. All of the rules under this prevailing wage requirement are defined by Davis Bacon. However, the weekly certification is not. So it's a matter of finding that balance between the information needed to reproduce this detail, as well as, you know, understanding there is an additional administrative burden of collecting it from not only your contractor, but your subcontractors. Um, the risk of proving that you've met these requirements is maintained. It says taxpayer, in this case, it would be the organization claiming the credit. Um, and those are, and then the two exceptions there. So beginning of construction, you know, there are specific rules within the tax code about how to identify what that is. So if you think you've started or you're about to break ground, you know, that's definitely something that can be evaluated to figure out if, you know, we entered into contracts year ago, we've, we've paid a certain amount of dollars or we've done X percentage of the actual physical work. Um, to document what our beginning of construction is. All right, so the other side, and honestly, from a prevailing wage standpoint with construction rates the way they are um, right now, at least in Denver, chances are you're already paying that prevailing wage. Prevailing wage is defined by the Department of Labor and it's kind of your base level union rates. Um, so, it's one thing, you know, you, you'd get those rates from your subcontractors, your architects, your engineers, and then you'd compare them to the Department of Labor. Um, and so then it becomes more of a tracking and documentation exercise versus an increased cost um, or increased rate. The other side of this requirement is the apprenticeship piece. This might be a little bit more challenging. So, they really wanted you to help booster the, apprentice, the registered apprenticeship programs. These are union-based programs. Um, and the way that compliance works is at least one in four laborers, um, or at least in 2023, at least 10% of the laborers associated with the implementation of the energy property are qualified apprentice, apprentices. Um, now there are there is an exception um, called the good faith effort. You reached out to these apprenticeship programs and they failed to respond within five days or they denied your request. Now everything is caveated, right? So uh, fail to respond within five days. It doesn't actually tell us how they have to respond. Um, so if it's an automated, hey, we saw your email and we'll get back to you, that potentially qualifies as a response. Um, and then the denied request, even if you reach out to one and you get that denial, you know, you have to show that you really tried. And so it's getting more than one denial. You need to reach out to maybe one or two. Um, but again, we don't have that clarity, but just show that you did put a good faith effort in trying to find a qualified apprentice um, to help with your qualified energy property and were denied. There are some cure provisions and the dollars are big because they're meant to be punitive. They really want this apprenticeship piece to be followed. Um, and it's $50 per labor hour needed to get to that 10% or $500 if there's an intentional disregard. So in the for-profit world, sometimes people like to play audit roulette as they call it. It's like, well, we'll deal with that when we get audited. Um, that kind of mentality can be quite costly um, with respect to this apprenticeship piece. So it is something that, um, depending on the size of your project and the size of your bill, it can give you pause. And we definitely want to talk through it. Um, I'd Bailey actually has an entire outsourced payroll group that just works in tracking and complying Davis Bacon for government construction projects. And so we've actually been working closely with them to figure out what is our best approach? How do we get around it? You know, it's not the entire build that has to follow these rules, um, but how would we how do we identify um, those laborers that were specifically related um, to the energy property itself? And again, we do have those two exceptions, so it's definitely a modeling exercise to figure out what our requirements are um, before we get into it. So if you're in that initial design build phase and you're looking to implement some of these properties, you definitely 
um, definitely want to just ask the question um, and see if there's a way we can kind of figure out the best approach if subject to those rules. The domestic content side. Um, so organizations are going to have to certify that the steel, iron, or manufactured product of a component in the, or the energy property was produced in the U.S. So steel and iron, it really fundamentally looks at the structural steel, which is often depicted as you know, or defined as the overall building structure as opposed to components of an energy property. So that's um, that's one question. That's definitely one question we still have um, open and have submitted comments in respect to is just clarifying the steel and iron pieces of these components. And then the manufactured product is it has to be at least 40% um, produced within the US. So this is something that you would work with say your solar panel manufacturer to figure out if you if they comply with the Buy American Act. And so, and it suggests similar documentation. Um, I know domestic solar is pretty hard to come by right now. Um, and you know, there's some energy properties that don't have steel and iron components to it, such as the electrochromic glass. It's a very small amount of steel associated, um, as well as you know, the geothermal wells. We're seeing it's it's not really the the steel or iron component pieces to it that make up the bulk of those systems. So it is definitely something we'd look at and we work with the vendor to kind of figure the specs um, on that property. But if we're able to make it, if we meet the Buy American Act, we get it, you get another 10% of your credit. So just to kind of give you an idea, and I won't go through all of the math um, at this point, but this is just kind of where it's showing, right? This is evaluating, you've got two different components of the same product, or excuse me, two different products, several different components, and just how they're made up and how they would qualify. So. Um, but again, it really is working with your vendor to see if we can get on that Buy America certification. Energy community. Now, again, I this is this is to me one of the easier ones to meet. There is a map on the Department of Energy's website, and you search your address, and you're either in the purple or in your orange. And if you're not in one of those, um, you're not going to qualify for this energy community. I will note another energy community is if you're located on a brownfield site. Um, we haven't seen too many of those, but if you are located on one, you are an energy community as well. Um, that is not shown on the website um, or on this map, but just know that it's out there as well. So the orange areas um, re relate to coal mine closures and the areas adjacent to it. And then the purple areas are certain MSA, non-MSA tracks that meet um, certain thresholds to qualify. And so if we're meeting all of these requirements as we go through this, we're now at 50% of our energy properties costs that we could get back as a rebate. Now we get into the environmental justice allocations. So these are for solar and wind projects that are less than five megawatts that are in one of four qualifying areas. So low income communities as defined by the new markets tax credit. Um, and there is also a map that you can search your address and the green area is the qualified area. Um, if the property is being installed on tribal lands, also qualify. Those first two are an additional 10% to your credit. So if we're kind of stacking all of these percents together, we're now at 50%. Um, and so the last two um, are an additional 20%. And so that gets you closer to the 70%. So the qualified low-income residential building project or a qualified low-income economic benefit project. And here there are certain requirements. There is an application that you have to um, file through the Department of Energy's website. Application um, opened up on October 19th. So this is for the initial application and depending on what category you're in, there's a certain amount of documents that also have to be filed. And this is important because these additional 
allocations are capped at 1.8 gigawatts. And it's based off the nameplate capacity of the energy property you're putting in, in service. So once they've awarded the 1.8 gigawatts for 2023, it gets cut off. Um, but there's another 1.8 gigawatts in 2024 that they'll also be allocating. Um, things to consider with this one is that you have to receive approval for the allocation prior to the property being placed in service. So if you are in one of these categories and you've almost got your solar ready, definitely apply for this before we hook it up, if you can, um, to see if we can get this additional 20% or 10%. Um, once you receive that allocation, you have four years to place the property in service. So if you're in the process, we have a couple of low-income housing projects actually that have a solar component um, that fill right into this qualified low-income residential area. And so once we get their certain documents executed and signed, um, we're working with them to go ahead and get their application in. The minute you have the information to apply, we recommend applying to get in line. The first 30 days, everyone who applies will have that number one seat and will get that treatment. Um, after that, it's on a first come, serve, first, come first serve basis until, until the 19th, or excuse me, uh, first come first basis until we get to that um, that 1.8 gigawatt threshold. So things to consider if you are investing in any of um, these qualified energy properties, you'll wanna document that beginning of construction date as well as that placed in service date. Um, now in monetizing the credit, there are those two new code sections and I'll get into those um, kind of at the tail end. There's a couple more credits I wanted to highlight that you might that might be applicable um, before we get into how to monetize them. But there's a direct pay option and there's also transferability. So generally with our low income housing projects, the actual solar is going into a for-profit entity. And so they'll have the ability to actually sell by just making an election on their annual filing under this transferability provision. So I kept both of them out there. Now, if the tax exempt org itself owns that qualified property that's entitled to this credit, you're eligible for that direct pay. And that's that's the rebate feature where you get the cash back. Um, you know, historically, there was a tax equity financing structure in order to sell or monetize these credits. So while it doesn't necessarily, it might lessen the need, um, we still are seeing them in place just due to overall financing. This is an investment credit, so you do have to spend the money before you can get it back. Um, and so we find that the tax equity financing instructions are still, structures are still a viable option. Um, just as it relates to financing and funding of the overall project. It's definitely a way that you can get the funding more upfront to help actually pay for it um, versus on the tail end of it. There is, um, for other tax exempts, um, if any of the project or the qualified property is financed with tax exempt bonds, there is a special, there is a haircut of about 15% of the credit amount not the credit percentage, right? So once we determine our credit percentage is say 50%, it's gonna be 50% of our cost to come up with whatever our final credit number is. And then the 15% would come off of that. And then there are special phase out rules um, regarding domestic content. Um, and as well as solar and wind, the tax code sections change in 2025. Um, but as of right now, if you're putting something, if you're beginning construction, that's where you're going to fall under this section 48 tax credit. And with that, I have the second polling question. Are you producing clean energy and selling to third parties? Yes, no, maybe. So in addition, in addition to investment credits, the IRA also has production credits. So that's kind of where this question's coming in. So May, whenever we hit 80 or 
90%. No, fair enough. Um, but for the 12% that may or definitely are, um, there are some in, there are some production credits that are also available. And so I'll touch on those at a very high level. Um, but similar to the 48 investment credit, we have 45. Um, we have 45, this renewable electric electricity production credit. So if you are producing energy from any one of these qualified facilities or resources, properties, um, and selling to unrelated third parties, you could be eligible for the production credit. And the production credit is based on how much electricity you're producing at a certain rate. So you'll see, once again, we have that base credit. If we, um, if the property is placed in service or built using the prevailing wage rules, that is, you know, it's, it's multiplied by five for a higher rate per kilowatt hour. Uh, here, the exception, um, there are still two except, exceptions as far as the, um, the beginning of construction goes, um, but not necessarily the max net output. If you're generating electric, electricity to sell, you're not gonna meet that one megawatt threshold. If you're able to build the facility using domestic content, it's another 10% um, of the credit identified. Um, and very similar, if you're in that energy community, you get the additional 10%, 10% here. And so these credits are calculated. So once the property is placed in service, these are calculated on an annual basis for the next 10 years. And so these can be pretty significant um, depending on how much electricity you're selling and producing. You know, if you look at it on a, you know, if we put the property in service and we're evaluating either the investment credit or the production credit in the current year, the investment credit may produce a higher benefit. But if you're looking 10 years out, that's where this production credit um, can come into play. With both of these code sections, um, the amount of kind of those baseline credits, not the environmental justice allocation, um, there is no current cap. So if you meet all of the requirements under 48 or 45, you are entitled to these incentives over the next 10 years. Things that could impact that would be if there are legislative changes, you know, not everyone was a huge fan of the uncapped nature of these incentives. However, that beginning, that this is where that beginning of construction really becomes important as it'll basically say you're entitled to it. And once it's placed in service is when we can go claim it. Um, you know, historically, we've only ever seen them change tax laws on a go forward basis. Um, to disallow it retroactively would be a huge administrative burden um, to kind of go and collect that from those who have already claimed it. So something to consider is that um, when you definitely, if you're if you're eligible for this production credit, you definitely want to model it out under both scenarios um, and to allow you to make a more informed decision about um, which, which is the correct path forward for your organization. Polling question three. Are you looking into converting your commercial fleet to electric vehicles? Yes, no, maybe. And all of the credits that we're talking about today are eligible for that direct pay option. Um, with the electric vehicles, there's been some new guidance that's more recently come out uh, that we'll go into as well. But all of these are available for tax exempt organizations that are making these investments. So not quite there on the electric vehicles. Um, if you do have a requirement that's coming up um, I, I know in California, the state is kind of mandating it to some organizations. And so um, definitely something to consider as the rules are a little bit different from the personal EVs. So clean vehicles and refueling infrastructure. So if you are investing in electric vehicles for your commercial fleet, 
there are credits. Um, <clears throat> there are two different thresholds of credits. If the vehicle's under 14,000 pounds, you can get up to $7,500 per vehicle. Over 14,000 pounds, up to $40,000 per vehicle. 45W, as long as we're meeting that, you know, we're, we're buying it for use or lease, we're able to take this credit. And this section doesn't have the same domestic um, domestic content or domestic manufacturing requirements as um, 30D, which is more, which is another credit that businesses could use to claim the 7,500, but 45W is less stringent, um, but 30D is also where the personal um, EV credit comes into play. And there are greater restrictions on where the vehicles produce and how to go about claiming it. Now for these fleets, they just issued guidance a couple weeks ago regarding how to go about this. And there could be one of two ways. You could claim it and get the cash back, but they also gave um, the dealerships the ability to kind of you to assign the dealership the 7,500 and then they would file them and pass that saving down to you. Like you allocate it to them, they allocate, you know, a reduced cost of the vehicle versus every organization filing these individually, just having the dealership file them um, on, on the taxpayer or an entity's behalf. So something to consider, there's two different ways to take advantage of 45W. Um, section 30C relates to the refueling stations. Historically, there was a credit for refueling stations, um, but this one's changed a bit. One, nonprofits are allowed to partake in it. Um, and two, it has to be located in a low income area. So back to our new market tax credit map. Um, so you'll see this is, this is a map of Dallas, the green area you're qualified, or if you're in a non-urban area. So, and that's defined by the Census Bureau that unfortunately didn't have as great of a map as everyone else, um, but they do have these spreadsheets. And so you basically go look to see if you are considered urban. And if you are not on that list, um, you could qualify for this non-urban area. The way the credit works is it's a baseline of 6% of the cost to install the EV, um, the recharging station, or 30%. And that heavily depends on if you meet prevailing wage and apprenticeship rules. And so that's working with your recharging station, your electrician, to make sure that they have those laborers in the mix when building this out. And so it's either six or 30% 30, 30 up to $100,000 per charging unit. Um, what we don't know is if a unit is one piece that can charge two cars or if it's like per car charging station or um, how exactly it works. But um, so far I haven't seen them, the overall cost of a recharging station really get up to $100,000, um, but it could just be, I haven't quite seen it just yet. Um, so that's another one. If you're, if you're building out the refueling aspect of it, then um, this may be available to you. And it really depends on where it's being located. It doesn't have to be available for public use. It could just be, you know, at your site, um, you know, available to, to either members or just local folks that are there. All right. So again, the EV charging stations, I'll note, while it does include the electric um, well, it doesn't include all the ele electrical infrastructure associated with these, any improvements to the land or the sidewalk kind of surrounding these stations does not qualify. Um, and so that's just something to keep note of is that any land improvements would not be considered uh, in the basis for calculating these credits. It really is everything else on top of it. Um, and again, with a commercial fleet, um, it's gotta be purchased for use or lease by the taxpayer, not held for resale and be propelled by an electric motor, uses an electric battery and is rechargeable from an external pool. So um, some hybrids could qualify, but it's definitely something that you'd wanna take a look to make sure you're within the confines of um, these definitions. 
All right, monetizing these credits and why you should care about energy tax credits. All right, so traditionally federal tax credits couldn't be bought and sold on an open market. Instead, we had these flip partnerships or those tax equity structures, right? And so this is where you would have the nonprofit be the GP um, and maybe some of the other investors would be limited partners and you would have that partnership acquire the energy property and then you'd be able to allocate and distribute these credits upward. Um, it is still a great way to raise capital on the front end to then be able to invest in these properties. However, um, they're not necessarily needed with some of these new provisions. So the big changes here allows for direct pay, um, which is essentially making these refundable, right? It kind of turns it into that rebate um, as I like to refer to them. It also allows for the transferability. So instead of setting up these investment structures, it really is filing the right paperwork, registering the property with the IRS and making the election statements on the applicable tax returns um, to essentially allow you to sell them. They do have to be sold for cash and so, or a cash equivalent, um, but there's just a few things that you have to make sure your purchase and sale agreement um, follows. We're starting to see the market adapt to these new provisions and how they'll be priced. Um, we've seen depending, it really depends on the size of the credit you're selling, um, but we've seen anywhere from 85 cents on the dollar all the way up to like 93 cents on the dollar. And so, and that really is, you know, as you get into maybe some of these, you know, eight figure credits, um, that that's kind of where we see that higher percentage. But there is, you know, that documentation requirement. And so your buyers are going to be doing their diligence to make sure that you're documenting prevailing wage and apprenticeship, you're documenting domestic content, um, documenting the energy community, you followed all the rules and registering, applying and allocating environmental justice. So there's definitely several components to it um, if, if you're looking to partake in these credits. So again, the direct pay. I will note there is a direct pay option for for-profit entities or any entity that is producing clean hydrogen or advanced manufacturing or sequestering carbon, which might not be totally applicable to this group. But if you find yourself capturing and sequestering carbon, there are quite substantial credits to be had. Um, alternatively for 48, 45, for the energy investment credits, um, those all fall under this 6417 direct pay. And if you're one of these eligible entities, tax exempt, um, government, you know, tribal, electrical co-ops, um, you could potentially, you will qualify for this direct pay option. So the registration process um, to go to get these credits, there, it, there will be one. They haven't opened the registration process up for the 48 and the 45, um, but they did open up the EV um, portal I, yesterday or the day before. So it's pretty, it's pretty new that it's been out there, but it also gives us an idea of what maybe the 48 and the other credit portals will look like. If your project doesn't fit within these eligible entities in 6417, such as some of the low income housing projects that we've seen, um, you still able, you're still able to monetize the credit under 6418. The whole point was to get cash back. Um, we used to have every organization be able to monetize these regardless of their taxable status. Um, so even companies and losses can generate these credits and sell them to kind of help with cash flow to really encourage organizations to invest in these types of properties. It has to be transferred for cash. It can't be resold. So you've got a one-time, you know, a one-time sell and buy option. So your buyer needs to make sure that they can buy it. Um, it's not considered income or expense for federal tax purposes. So it shouldn't impact um, any, you know, creating taxable income for your organization. Um, the buyer can't then, so buyer, 
the, C, the buyer can't then elect to make direct, direct pay. So you as a tax exempt org can't go buy these credits and then make the election. Um, something specific in the tax world is that the buyer, um, the, the buying of these credits will be treated as passive income for the buyers, which really limits the buyers to corporations or folks with lots of passive income. And that I can I can feel everyone just like cringing or just total blank stares on the passive income. But it's just something it's it's out there. Make note of it that you're really looking for C corps that can utilize these credits in that year. And we actually have like banks are are actually a really great um, buyer for these. And so we have several tax tax paying entities that are looking for credits to purchase as well. Um, the risk transfers to the buyer. So again, that's where that diligence comes in handy. And there might be some consideration for a tax insurance instrument to kind of help cover that risk. But I think for the most part, you guys will stay within this direct pay, um, this direct pay section. So how do we go about it? This registration process. So they did issue some guidance under 6417. Um, in the form of proposed regs, just saying this is the type of information we're going to be looking for. But they're really looking, they want longitude, latitude, um, coordinates of where it's being placed in service. So they really want to make sure it's going out there. You know, information about the organization itself, um, what type of property. We've sat in on a couple of IRS forums where they're trying to figure out what it looks like, what information they should ask for, what the turnaround time is. Um, and so hopefully it's come a long way since last time I was on one of those, uh, one of those groups, one of those group calls, but, um, but we're hoping with the EV registration that we'll see, we'll get a better idea what they're looking for. And then we've got these annual tax filings. And so most of you will be filing a 990 and these forms uh, which are very are the same ones as the for-profit world, right? You're going to be filing these credit forms um, with with your election statements attached to them and your registration ID. So at the end of the registration process, the IRS will give that property certain IDs. So if you have a system that's going in that is a microgrid controller that also has a solar and a battery storage component, you'll have three different IDs for each one of the pieces of property that'll go in. And so that information, um, along with any other information they tell us, we're still kind of waiting for more guidance um, that needs to be filed with the return, will go, will be attached to, <clears throat> to that 990. In lieu of a 990, um, if you don't have annual tax filings, then it'll be the 990T, that unrelated business income. And so we've been waiting for those forms to update and it's essentially filling out your organization's name and then saying you're filing it for these energy credits and direct pay option. And so once again, you'll be filing that 990T with the respective credit form and the election statement to get that rebate back. Um, as part of your documentation, you're gonna to wanna to document again that beginning of construction, can't stress that enough, and the place and service date is when you'll actually be able to go and claim it. Um, so something to think about is that, you know, being more of like a rebate, right? Where we have to invest to then claim. Um, you you go and you file, these, these forms are filed with your annual tax filing. And so it's going to be delayed. Um, into that next tax year when you get this cash back, right? Tax filings are always a year behind just by nature in general of tax forms. Um, so something to consider that you'd wanna have, all, once the property is placed in service, you really wanna do that analysis to get all of your paperwork ready so that when it comes time to filing your 990, you're ready to go, you have your registration ID and all of your information is in place um, prior <clears throat> to that tax season. Um, so that's where, you know, you'll, you'll get that. And then as far as the refund goes or the cash back, um, I believe they normally have 45 days. And if they don't get you their cap, your cash in 45 days, that's when they start charge or they don't charge interest, but they owe you interest on your overall amount. So that's generally the timeline. So if we have something placed on a calendar year end, if we have something placed in service, you know, 
November 15th of 23, it goes on our 23 tax filing, which is filed in 24. So from a timing perspective, I just wanna highlight that because funding can be an issue for some of these projects. <clears throat> the last thing I wanna make note of is just this recapture risk. So if for some reason, um, you're looking to buy or sell the building and um, you know you really need to hold on to the energy property for at least five years. Um, otherwise, there is this recapture risk that'll happen. Essentially, you owe some of the credit back. It is prorated to 2020, 20, like 20% 20 um, over the first five years, but just something to make note of. We had, <clears throat> we had a client that, was you know looking into these credits for their solar panels on their building, and it hadn't quite been in place in service. But the building was also available for sale, and it's like, well, you could get the credit, but then you might have to pay it all back, um, depending on when the sale goes through. So things to consider with your building as well as these improvements. You're going to want to make sure you hold on to that property for a little bit longer. And polling question number four. <laughs> How are your capital improvements financed? Municipal bonds, federal and state grants, commercial lending, donations. Excuse me. Um, so we do have a question. So um, will the contractor tell me it, like when I put solar on my house? There is a lot of knowledge and time involved in these. And so if you're looking, hopefully when you're building, <clears throat> when you're building these, then um, you're going to, you're gonna wanna model this out as part of your design. So your contractor, you're gonna need their information. You're gonna need their buy-in that solar is the route to go. Prevailing wage can be met if needed. Um, but you're gonna want to show that you've got this documented. So that's where kind of I Bailey can help in putting that information together and make sure you have what you need for your filing and claiming and registering for all of these credits. <clears throat> and so, um, so I believe if, if you still have more questions, I'm happy to take it offline or you can email me. Um, but, and then we have another question. Are you eligible for energy credits if you're not required to file a 990? You are. So you would just file the one time 990T that basically just has your location information. You'd have the credit forms apply to it and you'd make that election statement um, under 6417. And so that's that's kind of how you would go about it. And so we've worked with a lot of churches and schools and just energy, or excuse me, and even state government entities that aren't required to have an annual 990 filing. And so right now it's it's the 990T that would get is the vessel that you would file. And with that, I, I believe I'm turning it back over. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. And if there, uh, if if some of you think of more questions, please put them in the chat. We'll have a little bit of time at the end of the presentation to take more questions. But I will turn this over to Stephen. Great. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, Thanks for sharing some time uh, with us here today. Uh, we're going to be talking, you know, spending the next 45 or 50 minutes talking about mission aligned investing. And this is really, again, the concept of aligning an investor, an organization's capital with, again, their mission or values to help drive that continuity um, over time. A brief intro, again, Stephen Fraley. I'm with Innovest Portfolio Solutions. We are a Denver based. Um, investment consulting firm. Uh, I sit on the investment committee. I'm also the director of capital markets research. I primarily spend most of my time working with nonprofit clients. Um, so first and foremost, thank you everyone again for joining us. Thank you for all the work that you all do within your local communities 
for your organizations, of course, nonprofits are, are, are the backbone uh, of our community. So thank you for the time and, and all the efforts you guys have put forward uh, uh, in your roles and joining us here uh, this morning or afternoon, depending on where you're calling from. Again, a little bit on, on InnoVest real quick. Again, a lot of uh, nonprofit expertise going back to our founding 27 years ago. I spent a lot of time really working with our clients, working with nonprofits around the country to help build better aligned portfolios that are ultimately um, taking their dollars uh, another step further beyond just what they're doing, of course, um, with, with their beneficiaries, with their communities, but also how can we make those dollars stretch a little bit further uh, in providing positive impact based on what we're trying to accomplish. Um, 60 employees and advise on, on over 40 billion um, in client assets. Really importantly, I think, you know, we are independent and fee only, and we always serve as, as co-fiduciaries alongside our clients. So we want to share in that fiduciary burden. We want to make sure that, that we're doing everything in the best interest, of course, ultimately for uh, the beneficiaries involved. So that being said, uh, who's excited to get started? I'm glad to see this is actually working because I've had some presentations in the past where I couldn't actually get my technology to work. So you'll see a couple of, of themes similar to this from the office, which I'm a big fan of as we uh, continue on. So I can see everyone's excited here um, and we will get started. So again, key components in building a, a mission aligned portfolio. Here's kind of our agenda uh, for this morning. Um, we're going to start with really identifying, you know, the, the the time horizon of your possible investment portfolio. So this is really important um, from an investment decision making process, and ultimately drive, you know, the ability and the willingness for your organization to explore certain types of of mission aligned investing, and ultimately walking through that process. We're also going to discuss the nuances once we get to that point. You know, there's a lot of nuances to consider when trying to build a militia, uh, mission aligned portfolio. So we're gonna talk in great detail about what that means to you, your stakeholders, your board of directors, and of course, beneficiaries. Um, how you can execute that uh, with qualitative due diligence and, and understanding the process when, when, when considering investment managers to help again, further that alignment uh, with your organization. And, and of course, doing so by following uh, the best fiduciary practices um, through through time, making sure that you have a very strong process in place when going down this road. And we'll talk about that, you know, certainly more um, throughout the presentation. But one of the things that we'll certainly keep coming back to is that, you know, ESG investing, for example, SRI investing, you know, it's still relatively new. It's still relatively young. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, I'd say maybe bad actors out there, a lot of folks that are just trying to get involved because they see it as an opportunity. So how can we make sure, again, as a board, as a committee, um, that we are following those fiduciary best practices. So I'm going to go ahead and kick things off um, with our first polling question early here. Um, so that is, has your organization met with uh, third-party stakeholders or just stakeholders in general um, regarding maybe mission-aligned or moral investing considerations, right? So that could be, you know, your local community, local businesses, of course, donors. Um, has your organization met with third-party stakeholders to, to have this, this type of conversation? So we'll just give everyone a, a couple more seconds here um, to, to, to vote um, yes, no, or unsure. Hopefully that's pretty straightforward and then see what we get um, from the results. Great. So pretty mixed here, which, um, you know, I think is very common. So about 20% said yes, uh, about half said no, and, and the other 30% are unsure. Maybe, you know, based on their position, they're not sure if these conversations are, are being had. Um, but that certainly gives us a good understanding of kind of where the group is and really hope that, that you'll get, um, you know, a, a lot out of this presentation and maybe at least go back uh, to, to your colleagues and say, hey, this was interesting. Maybe this is something we should think about, maybe something uh, to, to jog our, our interest or, or foster those conversations. So I, I mentioned we kick off with the importance of time horizons, right? So time horizons when it comes to investing an organization's capital is imperative. So you're going to have, you know, very short time horizons that could be, you know, managing operating cash, 
to the left-hand side where, again, you don't want to take any risk. It's, it's purely there to help backstop your operations. Uh, you want to earn maybe a, a good interest on that particular investment, but you don't want to take any risk, right? So that's, again, very conservative, very, very low risk uh, type of investment. As we move to the, to the further right-hand side of this chart, you can see we lengthen out that time horizon. And a lot of organizations we work with think about their, their balance sheet, if you will, or their bucket of assets in what we'd kind of consider a bucket approach here, right? So it's the operating reserves, maybe they, they identify a pool of money that's going towards strategic uh, projects, maybe, you know, a new building um, that, that they're planning on breaking ground on. That could be, you know, fitting that that two to five year bucket. You have a little bit of time, but you but uh, you want to maybe earn incrementally slightly better returns. And then you have kind of your longer term buckets um, or, you know, to the far right hand side, your true kind of endowed assets or, or foundation that's really meant uh, to grow the bucket over time to ultimately support uh, further initiatives and just grow the presence of your organization and grow the benefit, of course, to uh, everyone involved. And so we'll dig into each of these in a little bit more detail on uh, the next few slides. So starting with, you know, kind of a short term funding bucket. This is what I consider kind of just beyond maybe your true operating cash, uh, where you're, you're maybe willing to take a little bit of risk, but certainly not expose this bucket of capital to, to much market fluctuation. So again, you can see how this is allocated here, majority in bonds, that's the teal color. And I am noticing that we're missing a color, that's the dark blue, that is uh, diversifying strategy. So maybe, you know, investment outside of stocks and bonds, maybe that's private market investments, maybe it's real estate, again, other investments outside of stocks and bonds, and then a very limited exposure to stocks. So again, majority of this portfolio being in high quality uh, fixed income or bonds that you're really just trying to earn uh, a stated interest rate over time. But you are trying to earn it, you know, maybe an investment above inflation, knowing that you can't take much risk and that you need significant liquidity, meaning if for some reason, you know, you went in, into a period of, of financial troubles where you're going through your operating cash. This is kind of that next bucket that you need to be able to tap. You need liquidity uh, to help with uh, the ongoing expenses for the organization. Next bucket, we consider, you know, again, more of an intermediate term um, allocation. Again, I kind of uh, highlighted this a little bit, um, but maybe a strategic project. I mentioned, you know, a new build out. Um, of, a, of a new building um, that you want to break ground on. Maybe it's a, a big technology revamp that you're going to undergo in a few years. And so you want to set aside some money uh, for that investment. Um, but this is maybe going to be kind of, again, three to five year uh, type of time frame where you can take a little bit more stock risk or equity risk, you can see in brown there, and maybe even incrementally more um, exposure to diversifying strategies but still going to have you know, a large portion of the portfolio in high quality bonds to help protect against too much market uh, volatility. So again, the, the goal here is targeting a slightly higher return than that kind of very short term bucket, understanding that in doing so, you're going to take a little bit more risk. You can see the downside risk there uh, we, we mentioned is moderate, and that is kind of what we're talking about there, downside risk. How much could you potentially lose or draw down in a you know, one year period? And then liquidity, moderate to high, meaning generally speaking, still have a lot of liquidity, still have an ability to, to sell these investments quickly if need be uh, to fund uh, business operations. And then the last one, again, building on the bucketed slide I, I presented earlier, kind of that long-term bucket, right? Where again, you really do have time on your side. You're really trying to grow uh, the corpus of the portfolio long-term to benefit the organization and of course uh, the beneficiaries. And so you're gonna have generally higher allocation to stocks because you have a greater ability to take more risk being that it's longer term in nature, right? You can handle some of the, the additional volatility across time. You're gonna have higher exposure to diversifying strategies there in blue and less exposure to, to bonds or fixed income. So you can see target return is higher um, downside risk certainly is higher because there's there's greater volatility potentially, and then liquidity uh, is not quite as high because uh, you know maybe that's because some of the diversifying strategies are less liquid. Private equity, private debt, for example, those private market investments might have much lower liquidity provisions. Um, and so again, thinking about those long term, it makes sense. Doesn't make sense for a very short term portfolio where you may need to tap 
uh, those assets to fund uh, the business or to provide grants, uh, et cetera. And just to kind of, you know, finalize, you know, the importance of time horizons, this is a, a survey put together by NACUBO, that is the National Association of College and University Business Office. This is strictly looking at university endowments, um, but it's one of the best publicly, publicly released kind of sources of investment data that we think is interesting to look at. And this is showing, again, all endowments that ultimately, you know, provide information, you can see from size of the endowment on the far right hand side, under 25 million to over 1 billion on the second column to the left and just shows how they're allocating uh, their dollars. Right. And so these are generally long term buckets of money, long term you know, pools of capital for the benefit of the organization. You can see, you know, these really bottom kind of four colors, the teal, the dark teal, I should say light teal, green, yellow, and dark gray are all what we'd consider kind of risky assets. So you can see equities, um, alternatives, vet, private equity, and venture capital. So you can see a lot of these portfolios do have a significant portion, over 60% or greater um, in these riskier assets. And as you go from under 25 million further to the left, you can see the big change is that a lot of that public equity exposure, which is the two kind of blue and green colors at the bottom, ultimately feeds into private equity and venture capital. So those are kind of some of those alternatives that I mentioned on, on the previous slide. So that's you know very common for nonprofits, for foundation or endowment dollars to um, put a greater portion of their assets into, again, less liquid uh, private investments to get those long-term uh, return benefits. So again, in the end, um, when we think about time horizons, you know, the real problem is not finding a good fund manager or a good investment. It's finding the right time horizon for your investing and what your temperament is for volatility. That's a quote from famous investor Peter Lynch. He was a portfolio manager um, of the Magellan Fund at Fidelity. And I think, again, this is spot on. It's really understanding your time horizon for your different pools of capital, for your different buckets of assets, that ultimately does drive um, your asset allocation, ultimately does drive your ability um, to take greater risks or to take on less liquidity um, in the portfolio. So moving on, so we've kind of you know laid the groundwork here with time horizon, how important that, that is, right? Because ultimately, you know, Figuring out the time horizon is going to allow for greater involvement of mission-aligned investing. And we'll kind of walk through that throughout the presentation. So the longer term the bucket, the greater opportunity to do, for example, impact investing or bring in other types of, of managers that might be aligned with your organization. So everyone is presumably, um, I think, heard of in some factor or another, you know, ESG, which is environmental, social, and governance, SRI, which is socially responsible investing or impact investing in some sense, again, or another. Um, I just wanna walk through again, kind of what exactly do these mean and how does this apply to our conversation today? So ESG is again, the concept that environmental, social and governance issues, for example, climate change and human rights, for example, can positively impact the performance of an investment portfolio and should be considered alongside a more traditional factor, right? So more traditional financial analysis. So Again, an example here would be, um, you know, you're looking at a stock. Let's pick one that we probably all know, Apple, for example. Um, probably 50%, if not more of us, have an Apple phone, either in their pocket, on their desk, or wherever they may be. Hopefully, some of you are, are, are calling in from the beach, and it's in the sand buried somewhere. So, um, But, for, for example, you're looking at Apple, strong financials. You say, this is a great company, but let's also look at what they're doing from an ESG or an SRI standpoint. And also consider that alongside, because a lot of people believe if they are, for example, advocates of, of a clean energy or a better environment, that is also going to provide better sustainability for the organization long term. So that's an example of, of kind of ESG investing. Socially responsible investing is really a strategy that aims to help foster you know, a certain social outcome while also generating positive returns. So this can be done by choosing investments either A, more aligned with your values, so positive screening, right? So if your organization is really focused on clean energy, it's adding incremental exposure or increasing 
um, the importance of those types of companies maybe within the overall portfolio, or conversely, on the flip side, avoiding ownership of companies uh, that aren't aligned with your um, with your organization or negative screening. So, you know, a great example here: we have uh, a nonprofit client that is is full mission. Their full objective is to help um, provide resources and research for lung cancer. Right. So for them, easy negative screen. They want to screen out all tobacco companies, any company that is deriving uh, uh, any portion of their business revenues from tobacco or tobacco substitute products or tobacco-like products. So that's a, a kind of an easy example of a negative screening um, in terms of uh, portfolio companies or sectors. And then impact investing is a strategy that targets something very specific on a social and environmental standpoint. So something very important to an organization while seeking what we call market rate returns. So they're trying to earn good returns, but just trying to do so and having more of a positive impact on something important to, to their goals and objectives or their mission. Um, so the goal is ultimately to use money and investment capital for positive social and environmental results. And these are just a few categories, right? That there's so many more. There's again, organizations that are focused on DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. We work with faith-based organizations that have other goals and objectives. So again, a, a lot of different variations here, and we'll talk a little bit more through some of these in detail on the next slide, which is one of my favorite slides. It's it's what we kind of call, you know, the investment spectrum here. Um, so as you go from left to right, you're essentially having greater impact um, within your portfolio. So Again, starting on the far left-hand side here, this would just be your traditional investing, right? Um, all you really care about is earning the best possible financial return, regardless of, of ethical or ESG factors. Moving to the right, I already talked a little bit about this. It would be negative screening. Again, narrowing your investable universe by excluding companies or sectors um, that would be in direct conflict with your mission with your goals, it would ultimately maybe ex expose your organization to greater risks. Um, ESG and SRI integration, that's when you're actually, again, utilizing uh, ESG and SRI factors to complement the traditional investment decision-making process. So that would be similar to the Apple example I walked through earlier. Uh, positive screening, which I talked about, that's seeking companies that specifically address, support, or benefit from uh, a targeted ESG or SI SRI themes. Again, so we have uh, an example, um, a nonprofit client that had specific donors that wanted to target, for example, clean energy investing. That would be certainly more of a positive screening or even a thematic investment, which is just to the right there. So that's an investment that would target something very specific to an organization, to an individual donor, like social equality, clean energy, resource scarcity, um, et cetera. And then again, kind of moving just a little bit further to the right there, um, impact investing. This would really be you know, targeting social and environmental impact, which I mentioned while seeking market rate returns, and then philanthropy. And that's kind of the, the same, same thought process as impact investing, but you're actually you know, seeking below market rate returns. And so you know, a good example, we have a client um, that provides a lot of funding and grants to other nonprofit organizations. They actually provided a below market loan to an organization that they work with, right? So knowing that this organization was going to have trouble um, seeking out a, a loan, you know, they're going to be paying higher rates. They decided as part of their, um, their portfolio, they wanted to use that to do some good. And so they ultimately provided a below market loan, which ultimately was going to provide this underlying organization a better opportunity uh, to, to grow and meet their financial needs. Um, going forward. Okay, sorry, I had to pause there for a quick drink of water. Um, so as we continue on, I think one of the most important aspects of deciding and ultimately building out a, a portfolio that does um, align with your values or that does bring in some of these key considerations is you know, the investment policy statement, right? This is the governing document that's going to house a lot of the roles and responsibilities, the context of the portfolio, the goals, again, the, the, the exclusions, the screens, anything like that, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail. Um, but it's so crucial from, from a starting point to really gain consensus 
at the organizational level or at the board of directors level around the issues most important to the organization, right? To, to really implement a mission aligned portfolio, to really have that flow through to the investments themselves, there has to be consensus. It has to make sense to the mission um, or the goals or values of the organization. If it's driven generally by, you know, a couple of strong committee members, for example, and they ultimately, you know, push through a lot of different investments and then they drop off the board, well, there may not be ongoing staying power to, to stay convicted and to ultimately move forward with that portfolio. So again, it really has to be important to uh, the organization uh, as a starting point. The policy statement would then ultimately establish revenue thresholds potentially uh, for uh, criteria important to the organization. So this could include climate risk. This could include human rights, working conditions. Again, these would be more of those negative screens. This is kind of usually a really good starting point for a lot of the organizations um, that, that we work with, right? So it's again, setting revenue thresholds, right? So it could be as, as you know, a zero tolerance policy. I don't care what they're doing, if they derive any of their revenue from, um, you know, alcohol, in this case, or tobacco, we don't want to own it. A lot of organizations that we work with will have some sort of threshold in place. Maybe it's 10% of, of, of their uh, revenue, right? And so the, the point is, because you really want to consider the overall portfolio allocation and diversification um, when considering screens, eliminating certain sectors, or eliminating certain certain companies. And a, a couple of key examples of that recently and, and over time have been energy, um, which has certainly always been kind of on the forefront, especially of ESG focused um, investment strategies and technology, right? So technology makes up a large portion of, uh, especially the US equity market and generally ESG or SRI strategies um, have overweights or more exposure to technology and generally less exposure to energy. So being aware of what that could do ultimately to the investment portfolio is really important. And so I want to walk through an example here on, on page 51. Some of you may have seen something similar to this at, at some point in their lives, but we call this kind of a, a periodic table of returns or a quilt of returns. And you can see this is breaking down performance um, of the S&P 500 by sectors going back to 2014. So it's looking at calendar year periods there, and then the year to date uh, through September 30th of 2023, and then longer term annualized performance on the right-hand side. And so again, I mentioned energy and I mentioned technology. Uh, another area that's very similar to technology is communication services. That's like the Alphabet, which is the parent company of Google, or Meta, which is the parent company of Facebook. Those, those types of companies fall within communication services. Generally speaking, a blanketed ESG or SRI strategy is going to be underweight energy and overweight communication services and technology. And just to highlight kind of how volatile those areas have been so far in 2023, great. You wish you were overweight, of course, to communication services and technology. Those have been the two best performing sectors. Um, now going back to 2022, energy by far and away the best performing sector. Again, if you were following a, a, maybe a blanketed ESG or SI approach and you didn't have any exposure to energy, that could really impact your performance and is going to make it look a lot different, for example, than the S&P 500 index, which is just an index of the 500 largest publicly traded companies in the U.S. So again, really thinking through these things. On the flip side here at the bottom of 2022, you can see the, the, the worst performing areas communication services and technology were both down, you know, almost 30 and 40% respectively, while energy was up uh, quite a bit. So again, part of the reason why it's so important to have conviction at the, at the organization level is because there are going to be variability of returns across time. And so look at the last three years annualized energy up 51% per year on average the last three years. If you didn't have any exposure there, we're very underweight there. You lost out on a lot of returns. But then certainly you can see longer term technology has been a better performer. So generally those two can drive a lot of, you know, kind of the ESG and SRI decisions. And it's really making sure that, that you as an organization and as fiduciaries are comfortable um, with, with some of that uh, volatility potentially. Okay, we're going to take a, a quick break here and pull up... Uh, I guess pun intended, uh, the second polling question um, of my section of the presentation. So would ownership of certain companies 
or exposure to certain industries be in direct conflict with the central mission and public profile of your organization? Uh, yes, no, or unsure. Again, would ownership of certain companies be in it or industries be in direct conflict with the central mission and public profile of your organization? Going to give you all a couple of more seconds here and see um, where we end up here as a group. Great. So this is really helpful, right? So I mean, over 40, 40% 40 of you, thank you all for participating, said yes, right? So that's probably a, a good place to start the conversation. Um, if you haven't thought about, you know, mission aligned investing or kind of how can you um, align your portfolio with your mission. Uh, so again, great place to start is kind of just having that conversation. And if you can clearly identify, then maybe, you know, that's something uh, that, that should be considered and should foster some um, additional conversation. So a couple more uh, slides here on kind of some considerations and I'm having, there we go, some troubles moving forward with that figured out. Um, you know, is the investment strategy or is the investment fund that you're investing in all in, right, on, on your mission or on your alignment? So what I mean by this is many ESG, SRI impact strategies are only what we'd say maybe 95% aligned, but re the reality is so are most just traditional funds that aren't labeling themselves as ESGs or SRI portfolios. They utilize a lot of these same screening processes they find it important in terms of their analysis, um, but maybe just aren't labeling themselves within the strategy. So what's in the remaining 5%? What's really important to the organization? Well, that remaining 5% is kind of what we consider, you know, what is the company engagement? Is the investment firm that you're allocating your money to, are they engaging the board of directors for the companies to help, you know, position positive change? Are they voting your, your shareholder votes in alignment with your mission? And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a couple of other slides, but ultimately it's kind of taking it the next step. What other positive influence or conversations is that investment fund or investment manager um, doing to help further and get that full alignment uh, from, uh, from a value standpoint? And so a couple of examples to walk through here. So we see a, a lot of cases, and again, we work with clients that have varying, you know, ideas and perspectives on, you know, what their investment portfolio should look like. But we often see a lot of times uh, advisors, uh, even fund managers, um, excusing ESG or SRI violations because, for example, it's a mutual fund or it's another pooled product um, where, hey, as long as we're not owning an individual stock, outright and we own it within a pooled vehicle that's not a violation of you know maybe my client's ESG or SRI portfolio so again something very nuanced like that is something that we believe is really important to understand and to get a full look through in terms of what the investment manager themselves um, is buying how they're investing ultimately uh, the strategies we also see um, index funds. So some of the large index funds that are just trying to replicate the underlying mark, you know, investment universe are promoting that they're socially responsible. Um, but are they actually voting your shareholder proxy votes in accord? So right, as investors, if we give our money um, as an organization to a large index fund provider and it's within an ESG strategy and we think, hey, they're doing everything we can, well, hey, we get votes when it comes to board of director changes, when it comes to objectives and initiatives of the underlying companies they own. Is, is that index fund actually voting in alignment with what we're trying to achieve? And, and in a lot of cases, the answer is actually no. Um, a lot of index funds over time have voted against proposals, for example, requesting disclosure of board diversity and board qualifications. Again, seems strange to me, especially if you're focused on uh, again, board diversity, board governance, DEI, um, you would want them to actually vote um, for having those types of proposals and having that kind of disclosure. We've also seen um, companies and index funds vote against really most environmental and social resolutions at the company level. So again, that's kind of taking a, a step further. And again, part of what we're looking at and making sure it's the right alignment 
uh, for our clients. So we're going to talk a little bit more about understanding the manager kind of screening process, right? So we've kind of come up with a plan. We understand what's important to us as an organization. You know, part of what Invest does is really understand the screening process, making sure that anything that we've put in within the investment policy statement for our clients, for your organization, is being acted on. The actual investment manager that's managing those dollars is implementing that within the portfolio. So we make sure the portfolios are screened to ensure they are in line with the stated values and objectives as highlighted in your investment policy statement. Uh, we think that's incredibly important. We're reviewing that on a regular basis. We're making sure, again, nothing's falling through the cracks. We're updating that, again, on a regular basis. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the, the, the manager screens um, and kind of what that looks like on the next slide. But one other item I wanted to touch on here is we're also seeing some managers claim that they do custom ESG or custom value aligned portfolios, but they're simply, for example, haircutting returns associated with your particular portfolio. Is that ethical? And let me walk through exactly what I mean and some examples that we've actually run into, especially in the alternative investment universe. For example, you probably maybe heard of hedge funds or other alternative investments. We were actually speaking with a hedge fund manager said, oh, yeah, we can create a custom portfolio. If your client doesn't want exposure to this company or this sector or this industry, you know, we they won't have exposure to it. Well, when we did some additional due diligence, we had further conversations. We found out that they were simply creating a feeder vehicle, investing our client dollars in their, their regular strategy. So those dollars were going into the companies they didn't want to own, but their performance was simply just not including those companies. Um, so they were basically just saying, hey, your dollars are going to those companies, but you're just not going to get the performance um, that are attributed to those particular companies. So that's, again, not exactly what our clients are generally looking for. If they want uh, to, to implement this type of portfolio, if they have certain uh, companies or sectors they don't want exposure to. It's not that they don't want the returns associated with it. They don't want their dollars ultimately um, going into those types of businesses. So again, a lot of people are out there are trying to find unique solutions, I should say. I, I guess I said that very politically correct and, and, and saying that they're aligned, that they do have ESG or customized portfolios uh, when maybe they don't. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later um, and talk about why. And that's because this market has just grown so significantly over the last uh, 10 plus years. So here's an example of kind of, you know, uh, just a very basic example of what we might use with a manager and with our uh, clients. So just again, to kind of get the wheels turning to ultimately kind of get uh, thoughts in motion about what might be important, what might be a consideration for our portfolio, you can see across the, the, the main kind of options here. So you see envi environmental issues here on the, the top left, conservation, faith-related issues, um, governance criteria, social criteria, as well as human rights. And again, this is not a, a complete list. This is just, of course, an example that we might walk through with our clients to kind of, again, foster these conversations and start uh, the discussion on what might be really important uh, to them as an organization. So quick status check, uh, we're about uh, 35 minutes in here. Just wanna see how everyone's doing. And because I can't actually see you and we're out here in person, I'm gonna assume everyone's doing one of these behind their desk, behind their computer screen. Um, again, if you're on the beach and you're doing this, even better. Uh, my wife actually just left uh, for Mexico and she is literally on the beach doing this right now, I believe, as we speak. So um, I'm jealous and I'm hoping some of you are also uh, getting that type of treatment right now. So the next several slides are going to be um, talking about due diligence and why it's so important, right? So performing heavy due diligence and, you know, why that's such a critical part in making sure there is full alignment, making sure that we're going through the correct steps to identify managers and ultimately put them into your portfolio and put your capital uh, to work. And so we really need to truly understand the intricacies of the investments. And when it comes to custom screening, when it comes to ESG or SRI, there's a lot more nuances, right? Again, because we don't want people just to be saying they're doing something. We want to see it in action. And so there's a lot more steps in the process. 
we want to, you know, be very comfortable with the team, first and foremost, with the investment process and their ability to execute. Ultimately, some of these qualitative aspects, like, again, the personnel, the alignment, you know, of, of our clients with the organization, um, the investment process itself ultimately is going to give us more conviction and more confidence in their ability to be consistent and provide consistent performance um, over time. Generally, if there are any uncertainties or red flags uh, when we're doing uh, work with a manager, then we just pass. Even if returns look awesome, if it's the best performing strategy uh, available in that category, if we see red flags, we're going to pass. Uh, we don't think it's worth any of the, the possible ramifications, any of the risks. Um, again, protecting you all from a fiduciary standpoint. And ultimately, on-site due diligence visits, we believe, are, are critical. So actually going to visit managers, seeing how they operate, talking to members of the team, um, understanding what are their, their risk process, their compliance, uh, very critical. You know, A couple of quick examples here um, from some of our on-site due diligence. We had an investment manager that we were looking into really strong performance, really nice marketing materials, had conversations with them um, over the phone. Everything looked great. Everything checked out. We did an on-site visit and we were, just to say it, nicely less than impressed with their operation, right? They were basically operating out of um, someone's basement. Not that there's any problem with that from an investment standpoint, but from a risk standpoint, from a from a, a compliance oversight standpoint, we didn't think that they had the right technology in place to, to ultimately protect our clients um, from, from possibly a, a negative outcome. Uh, we've also seen a manager that we were diligencing that, again, went on site and the entire time, all they wanted to talk about was, hey, you guys need to come up you know, upstairs and check out our, our um, event planning and entertainment business. And, and we're kind of saying, well, you're an investment firm. What are you doing here? And we went up up to, to that floor and it was the most beautiful, most unbelievable um, space we'd ever seen. And, and that was certainly a red flag because, wow, it sounds like they're spending more time trying to build out um, an event planning business than they are uh, focusing on, on investment. So that's one, again, that we, that we passed on uh, for those reasons. So just again, so, some anecdotes there in terms of what we've seen in the real world. Um, and why we think it's so important to actually go visit these companies and knock on doors and, and talk to, to employees to really see how they feel about um, where they work, their boss, the collegial atmosphere, um, et cetera. It's amazing how you know you can go talk to somebody on a, on a Zoom call. You can you know have all these conversations. Everyone seems like they're getting along great. And you go talk to them in person, maybe you know independently, and you get a little bit of a different uh, feel. Um, for you know how they maybe are, are feeling about their their current employment. So um, demonstrating process very important. Uh, smaller universe of available investment managers and strategies generally within this space within the again the the socially responsible investing the mission aligned investing space. There's generally a smaller universe of overall uh, investment managers though that is that is increased quite dramatically. So there is about a hundred or so available strategies um, going back about 10 years to, to 2011 as of 2020. And I don't have updated numbers uh, as of this moment, but that increased from about 100 to 400, right? So 4X the number of strategies. And a lot of that was because, right, money was moving into the space. People were becoming more interested in it. And so, hey, you know, we should maybe start doing, you know, a blanketed ESG or SRI strategy because a lot of people want it and there's money going there and we want to, you know, improve uh, the revenue and the profitability of our firm. So a lot of things we need to consider. Um, and some of the issues that we see within this space, again, there may be an unproven team because A, they had been doing something else and all of a sudden decided, hey, we're going to launch um, an environmental impact strategy, even though they don't really have much experience there. It could be an inconsistent philosophy. Maybe this was a manager that was doing something completely different. And all of a sudden they decided, hey, this is where the money's going. So we're gonna we're gonna start doing a, a custom strategy there, which is again against their kind of core investment philosophy. Maybe minimal assets. That's the other again because this is a newer segment of the market. A lot of funds and a lot of strategies maybe have lower asset bases. So it's you know being comfortable maybe with that. Again, shorter track records in general. You may only have a couple of years of investment performance that you're that you're going off of versus you know more traditional investment strategies might have 10, 15, 20 plus 
year track records where we have a little bit more uh, conviction in how they can handle um, investing over long periods of time. I mentioned a couple of the items earlier, right? Possible significant underperformance relative to the indexes because of those sector exposures. And then ultimately one of the big hurdles is um, higher fees. Um, generally speaking, there's more work that goes into creating these custom portfolios or having these additional screening uh, processes in place that generally is going to lead to higher overall fees to invest in those types of strategies. So again, something else to consider. You know, I mentioned you know the amount of money coming into the space. Again, dramatic, dramatic amounts of dollars globally. So again, going back to 2010, about three trillion dollars in total were going towards what we'd consider kind of overall kind of impact related or socially responsible investing strategies. As of last year, that's about 41 trillion uh, globally. So from 3 trillion to 41 trillion in about 12 years. So again, when I say that investment managers are going to the space because there's a lot of money coming, there's a lot of money coming into this area and people want uh, their share. So again, doing the due diligence, going through the process, making sure you're documenting this as a committee, as a fiduciary, so incredibly um, important. And then the last item on due diligence that I want to touch on is kind of, you know, taking it a bit further, right? So it's the actual alignment with uh, the investment manager's mission. So we talk to a lot of clients, they don't care about this. They just say, hey, look, if you can build the portfolio that I want, you can screen out the companies I don't want to own, you can add exposure to the companies I do. Um, that's great. That's what I care about. Some of our clients actually want alignment to go not only at the portfolio level, but actually at the, the organization level. So who is actually managing their money? We want to make sure they, as, as a culture, as a, as a company, as an organization, are also aligned with our mission and think the same way we do. So that's kind of taking things um, to the next level. So you know, a lot of organizations find it important to hire investment managers with their same values or moral obligations in mind. This is something we've gone through with clients. Uh, we had a client uh, a couple of years ago that was invested in a custom strategy based on, again, all the things that we've laid out, walked through the investment policy statement, had significant conversations at the organization level, at the committee level, came to a custom portfolio that they felt really good about, that we implemented, performance was fine, no issues at all, getting everything they wanted. But um, they question, you know, is the actual manager in alignment with our mission? And in this case, we had seen some things that that led us to believe that maybe they weren't. Um, maybe they weren't um, focused and, and aligned to the same extent that our client would have liked. And so we went back to the client and ultimately they decided, um, hey, this is great. Appreciate you taking this back to us. We would like to find a different manager that, again, from a culture standpoint, is more directly aligned with how we're thinking, how we're wanting to, to move forward. Um, in, in our organization's goals and objectives. So again, that's again, a, a little bit more, uh, not, I wouldn't, don't wanna say the extreme, but kind of further onto that spectrum uh, to the right-hand side. All right, excuse me there. Um, so that kind of concludes the, the due diligence standpoint. And then the last couple of slides are really focusing on fiduciary best practices, right? So anytime we're having these types of conversations, you know, we want to make sure that everything is documented, that we are following a process. Everything we do, again, we serve as co-fiduciaries with our clients. We want to protect our clients against any possible uh, um, situations, litigation, of course, et cetera. And so for institutions and nonprofits, the law does certainly embrace process. Uh, that's clearly emphasized in uh, MIFA, which stands for the Uniform Prudent Management of Institutional Funds Act, um, and, and that is clearly stated. And so the way we like to look at process is kind of highlighted there on the right-hand side. So it's kind of listen, analyze, strategize, ultimately implement, and then that ongoing monitoring. Um, and so we just think it's so important that organizations follow a process and document their decision-making. Ultimately, if you follow a process, you're going to be fine, right? If you can show that, hey, look, we did the work, we've had meetings as a committee, we focused on asset allocation and diversification, we delegated responsibilities to prudent experts, whether it's a legal team, whether it's you know tax advice, whether it's investment advice, um, we delegated to prudent experts 
Um, and we're monitoring those experts and ultimately monitoring, monitor, monitoring, excuse me, uh, costs, right? Because you want costs to be reasonable. Ultimately, every dollar that can stay with the organization, of course, has that, has that much more benefit. Every dollar that can stay within your investment portfolio can ultimately stay within the portfolio and compound over long periods of time and ultimately just grow that pool of assets um, long term. We think an important part of the process is coming up with a target allocation as stated within your investment policy statement and then rebalancing the portfolio back to those targets when they get out of line. And so a, a simple example there would be, you know, say you had a, a portfolio that was 60% stocks or equities, 40% bonds or fixed income. And, you know, we went into 2020, very interesting, very strange year, certainly that I think, you know, I speak probably not just for myself that we're all trying to get past it and certainly forget. Um, but in March of 2020, the S&P 500 dropped 35% basically in 30 days, the fastest, most aggressive decline basically in market history. And so that 60% stocks that you had all of a sudden became much lower because we saw market value uh, declined so much. And so what we would do, not because, again, we thought that we knew where the market was going or that we could time the market or because we thought we knew something that others didn't, is our process as laid out in our clients' investment policy statements dictates that they rebalance the portfolio back to those equity targets. So we were selling fixed income or bonds that had generally held up much better and bought stocks when they were down to get back to that 60% target. Then when the market bounced back and rebounded, our clients had that full allocation and ultimately saw their returns bounce back very strongly because again, they were at their full equity allocation. Then of course, avoiding conflicts of interest, of course, any board of directors, any committee um, certainly needs to consider any possible conflicts of interest that they may have. And we'll talk a little bit more about a, a couple of these in our, in our remaining slides. So again, fiduciary responsibility focuses on process, not outcomes. That's why it's so important to document the decision-making process, the decision-making criteria through the investment policy statement. Um, poor performance happens, especially if you're using active management, especially if you have a custom portfolio that does um, you know, have an extension of your goals and your mission, and your values, it might look very different than, again, the S&P 500 or the index. And so that's OK, as long as, again, you can tolerate that as an organization, you can stay with that over time. And that process and those steps have been documented within the investment policy statement. Uh, committee, again, needs to monitor manager costs, of course, uh, manager third party costs and vendor costs performance, of course, and those screens. So if you do implement screens within the portfolio, it is ultimately you know, your responsibility to follow those screens to make sure uh, that they are being implemented. And then ultimately try to evaluate the success of the emission aligned investment portfolio. There's various ways to do so, depending on the kind of involvement or impact you're trying to um, ultimately achieve. That usually lends to, to greater measurables. Um, and you know, if we had more time, we could speak a little bit more about that. Um, but um, certainly important to at least revisit, discuss how the portfolio is done. Is it meeting your goals um, and objectives as an organization? And then board member conflicts. Again, very important to kind of you know weed these out to understand what ultimately could be a conflict of interest at the board or committee level. Um, a, a quick quote, a fiduciary whose duty is to serve the best interests of its client, clients, including an obligation not to subordinate clients' interests to its own. So Additionally, an advisor uh, that has a material conflict of interest must either eliminate that conflict or fully disclose any possible conflicts. We've gone through this. We've seen this happen with clients, maybe not intentionally, but it's happened. And we've had conversations. We said, look, hey, this is a real conflict of interest that we're seeing. Um, this is what the problems potentially are. This is how it could impact you as an organization. Let's find a way to, to make sure that we can remedy this situation. Let's talk with all the parties involved and find a solution where we are, again, removing that conflict of interest. We are communicating it, and we ultimately uh, can make sure that we are on the straight and narrow on a go-forward basis. So it happens. Um, it, it's pretty common, actually, but it, it's also pretty easy to, uh, to, to, to find a solution to. So the last polling question that I have, and then I just have, I think, one concluding slide is, you know, what is... Uh, your biggest concern as an organization 
um, and maybe you haven't thought about this, so um, with exploring potentially a mission aligned investment portfolio. So again, lack of knowledge, maybe higher fees, performance concerns, or something else uh, that either A, I didn't talk about today, which hopefully I did, or that something that, again, you guys are thinking about. So um, again, what is your biggest concern with potentially exploring um, a custom mission aligned portfolio? Is it lack of knowledge, higher fees, performance concerns? Or again, something uh, completely uh, different. So just give everyone a couple more uh, seconds here and we'll see what uh, the group came up with. All right, yeah, so I'd say pretty pretty typical here, right? So performance and concerns generally is the, the highest, uh, the biggest concern for organizations is that, hey, what if we go down this path and this leads to underperformance, that leads to ultimately not us, you know, the ability for us not to be able to grow that pie to the extent that we could, right? I mean, that's certainly a, a challenge. Lack of knowledge, of course, is certainly something that, that we've we've talked about a little bit today. And hopefully some of what we've talked about today is, is filled the gap a little bit and has helped foster some conversations and, and maybe some things going off that say, hey, all right, this makes sense. Maybe we need to have some, some conversations about this. So I'm going to finish up with just a couple of slides here. Um, again, building a purposeful portfolio, really the goal is, you know, a mission aligned portfolio with a forward based outlook um, and objective due diligence. Again, emphasizing process not prediction, focusing on asset allocation and diversification, which we've talked about, and ultimately trying to do so using low cost, uh, ideally non-proprietary investment products. So um, again, lower costs ultimately lead to more money staying in that portfolio to compound um, over time. So in conclusion, again, key takeaways, that first polling question, great starting point, would ownership of investments in certain companies or industries be in direct conflict? with the public profile or central mission of your organization? It sounded like, yes, if I recall, it was 40%, but I've got a poor memory, so, um, but that's what I believe, I think, which is a good a good portion of you. So that's a good starting point. Clear process and policy needs to be in place. Um, you know, have to man you know, monitor fees uh, for those managers and know that ultimately there's likely gonna be higher fees. There could be performance issues. Um, over time. And I think the most important aspect is the committee or board needs to have the stamina to stand by their decision in all markets, especially during periods of underperformance. I talked about that earlier with energy specifically being the best performer over you know the last three years, but really underperforming periods before that. Can you tolerate that type of, of volatility from uh, the index? And so I'm just going to wrap it up and see if there are any specific questions. Um, from the group, and of course, end with one more um, gift from the office, uh, one of my favorites here. So happy to answer any question um, that anyone has, and otherwise, uh, appreciate everyone's time uh, this morning or afternoon, again, depending on, on where you're at. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. I don't have any questions right now that are direct to your presentation, so uh, we'll move forward to Ben. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks everyone and uh, appreciate it and look forward to hearing Ben. Thanks, Stephen. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Awesome. Yeah, I'm just going to get set up here for a second. Oh, wonderful. All right. Let me just get set up here. Forgive me. I thought I was sharing. I thought I was sharing my screen. So um, if you, you can have control of, of my screen, you should see those two little arrows. Let me try it again. Yep. I've got it. I've got it. Okay. Yep. Let's just make sure. Let's see. Awesome. All right. I am ready to roll. Thank you all so much for, for joining us today. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Ben Doming. I'm the director of Amphil. We'll chat about uh, uh, who Anvil is in a second. Um, I've been uh, working in the nonprofit space, raising money for over a decade now, which has been pretty fun. I have a, a master's degree with a with an MBA with a concentration in uh, philanthropy from the University of Mary in Bismarck, North Dakota. Um, and so, and been raising uh, millions of dollars. Uh, and, and, and I had so much fun doing that. I got a phone call from my old boss and close friend who said, hey, we need your help to come work in Anvil. 
would you join? And, and I've been doing that for the past couple of years. So it's been a pleasure. Uh, and I live here in the Denver area. Um, so I have the great joy of working for AMPHIL. And so uh, AMPHIL uh, used to be known uh, as American Philanthropic. And we found a very interesting thing uh, that people can't say the word philanthropic, which is which which sounds uh, funny. It is pretty funny. Uh, they'd say, uh, we love American phil 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 Philanthropic, which is pretty funny. Um, but it, ultimately, our mission is to strengthen civil society and to strengthen the nonprofit sector. We are founded in 2009. I've been growing... Uh, with a pretty rapid rate, the 100 employees and 750 organizations that we serve, and we annually help give away or raise $2 billion, which is pretty fun. Who Anvil is, we are an integrated professional services firm for nonprofits, meaning we're not just a consulting firm. Um, we don't, we can't just, we're happy to come alongside of you and build, build out strategy, but also implement the work that we, uh, that we are saying. We're very much mission aligned with our clients. We're intensely mission driven. Um, and we really believe in this sector. Uh, also, we're integrated, right? We want to make Mary strategy with that execution. So a lot of times uh, nonprofits will work with a group who just do direct mail or just do campaigns. Uh, but we see you holistically and where you're at in the life cycle of an organization. And we, want to, we want to honor that uh, and meet you where that's at. Uh, next thing is the knowledge and expertise. Well, while we have years of experience in the nonprofit sector, we also... Uh, like academics really wanted to know the sector, like the back of our hands. So we codify things like giving rates, response rates, um, average gift sizes, monthly giving. And, and we, we use that information to, to build out that strategy. So just so you know who you're talking to today. Uh, so some preliminaries that I wanted to chat through today were uh, uh, before we get to the five ways to accelerate major gifts for your organization. One is kind of framing the art and science of fundraising. Um, what we believe at Amphil is that fundraising is not rocket science. It's doing the right, right things the right way consistently over time. And the big question is, well, what are the right things and what is the right way and how do we do this, right? Um, because while, while you can do everything right for a major donor and ultimately they decide not to give a gift, which has happened multiple times, even just this past week for me, a donor said, hey, I want, this is what I want. This is what I want to fund. I wrote a great grant. And he said, no, nah, just decided not to. Or you can do everything wrong. And yet the donor says, nah, I still like you. Here's a hundred grand. The reality is it's building consistency over time and building up the entirety of the development department and with it, the organization, right? So, so what are the right things? And so what we say is the formula for fundraising success is I think um, all of these things that we're going to talk through today are, are going to be, uh, or all of these things in the preliminary are what's going to make up foundationally. But I would say in a, in a special way, the, these four things would be one, a strong and compelling case for support for when we're talking about the formula for fundraising success. So in every case for support should, should outline the problem. What is the problem? What is the, uh, it, it, Jerry Panis used to say, he was the grandfather of fundraising said, if you don't save lives or save souls or, or you're not a university, you won't be able to raise money. So what is that compelling case for support with the problem? What's the statistic that codifies the problem? Why you, why you exist? And what's your vision? What's your 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 big, hairy, audacious goal for the organization? And then what do you actually do? What is it that you actually do day to day? And what are some results from the work that you you've done? The second thing is leadership. Uh, leadership uh, for formula for fundraising success need to be compelled. Um, that building up a major donor program or, or development is important. I have seen time and again, leaders cannibalize their own efforts. Uh, and you think that might be contrary, but, but it's, it, it happens all the time. Um, and when it comes to leadership, you don't need necessarily a, char uh, a charismatic leader. What you need is someone who sees that it is important and wants to make it happen and uh, humble enough to understand that they don't know it all. Right. Nobody gets into development or gets into nonprofit to fundraise. Um, that's typically not how people get in uh, to working for nonprofits. The third would be enough prospects that have both the affinity and capacity for your organization to support your organization in a deep, deep way. Affinity and capacity are God given, right? That can't control someone's love of your organization, nor their capacity and their willingness to give. And lastly, is a plan to make it happen. Right? What's your fundraising plan to make it happen, which we'll touch on a little bit today. What ideally, uh, to, to accelerate major gifts, you ideally want to commit to making a major donor program. 
well, uh, some of the executives that I coach, uh, it's funny, they'll travel to, to conferences and, and link up with other executives. And they'll say, hey, what's what's your secret? What's your secret? And, and they're looking for that silver bullet. And they say, oh, well, we, uh, what we do here is our grant program. Oh, that's amazing. And then they fly home and they go to their development staff and say, scratch everything you're doing. We need to build out grants, right? And then they go to their next conference and they say, what are you doing? They say, oh, we have a crazy monthly giving program. Oh, that's amazing. And they fly home again saying, scratch what you're doing. We need to do monthly giving. And so I think what's important is that it takes, the, all of those things are great. Direct mail, uh, uh, foundations, all monthly giving, right? Are all great strategies. But the reality is nothing beats a major donor program in terms of the scalability of it, right? Nothing beats building out plans for your top donors to ask them for significant gifts that move the needle for your organization when you're doing it over a cup of $5 cup of coffee uh, that they usually pay for. And so uh, what we see is uh, on, on average, on the whole, uh, for a new major gift officer to be added, it takes about 18 months to break even. Now that that's on average, that depends on the size of the organization, its maturity, the maturity of the development officer. That aside, I will say for organizations who have unrealized potential, say who have never done major gifts, that number is drastically shifted up, right? So there's a group I work with, uh, they've been operating for about 35 years, doing great work, important to the community, but not uh, leveraging their major gift program really well. In their first 100 days, and I hired uh, their new major gift officer and trained him and placed him. In his first 100 days, he raised $70,000. And, and, and because he stuck to the principles that we're going to chat here today about. And uh, uh, because they had a lot of unrealized potential. And so I think you have to make that commitment that there's going to be a front investment on development. Defining a major gift, right? There, I would say the first thing to note is that there are multiple uh, levels of a major gift, right? The, the first, I would say there's primarily three. First would be how a donor defines a major gift. If a donor hands you $500 and says, wow, my wife and I were so, super excited to support you guys for our major gift of $500. Woe to you if you ever say that that's not a major gift. That is that person's major gift and we're so incredibly grateful for it. Uh, then, but, but it's important to know these levels. The second I would say is what does your staff consider a major gift? What is major to them they get excited about um, about closing, right? A development officer closing that, that gift might be 2,500 or 5,000 if they're new or 10,000 are a big number to them. But, but then there's a third, which would be a leadership level gift, right? One that gets your board chair, um, or your president or CEO so excited that they call their spouse and say, you'll never guess what happened today. We closed the major gift. And it's important to recognize, um, all of those levels. So you can, uh, what I, that one of the most common pitfalls in nonprofits is that we don't celebrate enough. We don't say thank you enough, not only to the people who are giving, but to the people who are doing the hard work of asking for money, uh, right? In the case of the donor, we wanna celebrate the donor and say, wow, thank you so much for your generosity. We're grateful for it. Now we wish it was higher, but we wouldn't say that, but, um, but you'll stumble upon uh, pe people's um, widow's might that ends up being a lot more than you know, uh, what, what I consider my small, uh, my big gift is someone else's small gift, right? But we want to honor them. We also want to honor our staff who are doing the, the frontline fundraising. But when a leadership level gift comes in, we want to honor the whole staff, right? Um, that, uh, hey, it took all of us here to realize this gift. And we want to say thank you all. I'm going to have everyone in the atrium. You don't have to announce who it is, but major donor step forward and give us this level of a gift. And I just, it, it is a tribute to, all the hard work that all of you here are doing. And so I just want to say thank you. And maybe you toast them or you celebrate with a cake or something, you know, it doesn't have to be much, but that you honor people. Lastly is you want to be comfortable with talking about money, right? Um, money, believe it or not, is not inherently evil. Uh, so uh, one of the greatest examples I've had of this is there's a development director I worked with and it was, uh, who was reporting to me. And he was so uncomfortable about talking to donors about money until one day him, him and his wife were asking for a financial advisor and the, they were sitting down for a cup of coffee. And as they were sitting down at the table, the donor, the, the advisor looked at him and said, so how much money do you make? And he's like, it was that moment that he realized he's a professional. That's why he's able to ask for money. And that's why he's able to talk about money, not flippantly, but in a way that only a professional can be. In the same way, my wife is an OB. 
She's able to talk to people about OB issues. Uh, I would never talk to someone about OB issues because I'm that's not my profession, right? And so, so it's about being a professional in the workplace. That's why we're able to ask about money. We're at probably um, to some ask more intimate questions about surrounding their money uh, than others, but because we're a professional. And the last point, right? The acceleration, accelerating your major gifts program from your status quo to more and better major donors. I always tell people that the, the way to start raising a lot of money is to start raising by a little money. Now that sounds, can sound cute or trivial or trite, but the reality is a lot of times we're not currently playing in the sandboxes of people our donors or philanthropists that we would like to be, and that's fine. Well, let's start playing in the sandboxes that we currently are in and actualize that, and that typically raises the sights for others. There was a donor that we're working with. Uh, he wouldn't consider us an organization I worked for, and they wouldn't consider us for a major gift from himself. And uh, we said, hey, but we're the largest national organization serving this niche, and here's why. And he said, yeah, but you're just not big enough for me. I, I typically only give to major, major organizations. And it was really frustrating. So we, we, we kind of uh, released him and said, hey, let's focus on what we can, continue to raise money. They were wrapping up a $250 million campaign. And that, we got in front of that donor years later. And he said, wow, you guys have grown so much. And let me see who's on your board. Oh my gosh. And they're part of it. And they're, wait, they're on your campaign, Kevin. How did you guys get? What we did was we continued to raise a lot more money, but also by the leadership that we brought in, raise the sites for this donor to see us properly. So typically that's what I like to share. All right. Polling question number one, your development department has a really strong major gifts program, true or false? Would love to see what your thoughts are. Feel free to ask me questions uh, throughout this time. All right, did we get the results? False, all right. So 56% of you all said your de development department has a really uh, does not have a really strong major gifts program. So I'd like to know why uh, you guys thought that if there was, uh, you weren't raising enough money. What, what I will say is of all the organizations I work with, I have yet to meet an organization who's saying we're raising just enough money, uh, right? So that's that's pretty funny. I think that we, we could always use a little bit ex uh, extra. So, and for those who answer true, I'd, I'd be curious to see, um, uh, you know, what, what, uh, uh, Made you, uh, what, what led you to say that you have a strong major gifts program? Is, is it you're raising a certain amount or do you have a really strong team? I would just be curious to, to know that. So if you want to put that in the chat, I'd love to see that. Awesome. Right. So previewing the five actions. So the five actions to solicit major gifts are meetings, meetings, meetings. Track leading measures, not lagging measures. Developing engagement plans for your top 10 donors, conducting face-to-face -face research, and asking for money. Those are the top five. And dare I even throw out a 2B, which is offering activity bonuses for staff. The first one, meetings, meetings, meetings. I cannot harp on this enough. I had a development officer, I was leading an offsite for a team, for a major gifts team. And he said, he said, this, this one guy who raised his hand, and he said, uh, do meetings really correlate to more money for, for a nonprofit? And I said, but you're a major gifts officer. What does it, what's your role? If your role is not to meet with people and then ask them for money, um, how are you going to raise that money? How are you going to bring your organization top of mind for these donors that they're, that they, uh, grow their emotional engagement to your organization to feel so moved to support you? And if it's not by meetings, and typically major donors typically do not respond to direct mail. Not saying that they can't respond to direct mail. I will just note that if you do send them direct mail, typically you want to send them higher packages, right? So if your uh, director of response uh, uh, sends you uh, uh, an invoice saying, hey, we need to pay a higher premium for this package for these major donors, yes, they're, they should be approved, right? That's typically when they respond. And it can also include a software ask. But I cannot um, stress how important this is, is enough meetings. And we'll get into, well, how many meetings, right? Which is tra tracking leading measures, not lagging measures. 
so often I feel like we're folk, uh, the VPs that I work with and CDOs focus on how much money they're raising, which is great. And I think that you should, should keep an eye on that. But really, we want to track, as my old VP used to say, let's track the activity that leads to productivity. What are the inputs that are going to set forth really strong outputs? And typically for major gifts, they are how many meetings that you're doing. I, I personally like to do per quarter as opposed to monthly. Um, how, of those, how many are discovery visits? So meeting entirely new people. How many of those meetings are uh, asks? What, what percentage of those are asks? And uh, if you, um, you could also incorporate things like plan giving visits, how many plan giving visits you have, or even stewardship, right, for a mature program. Um, so what I typically look for on a quarterly basis, a full-time major gifts officer, I typically think of um, roughly uh, 15 meetings per month, which is about 45 per quarter. Um, it, then about 10% of those of all quarterly activity being new major donors, because if you're not continually filling your pipeline, you're just going to suffer attrition. And then uh, also about a 45% solicitation rate. So, so more than half of their meetings, they're either meeting new people or asking for money. That's typically what I like to do. To kind of scope in now if they have another um uh role within the organization you can mix it, match that with the other uh their other priorities right another thought is to offer activity bonuses for staff right um for for the staff we're doing frontline Pfizer fundraising a quick note here is if development was easy everyone would be doing it but the reality is it's not the the average lifespan of a development professional is under 18 months. And then if, if uh, uh, and typically when they leave, they leave the industry altogether. If you haven't noticed, it's really hard to find high performing, uh, especially major gift officers. So if you have one, keep them. One way to do that is to offer activity bonuses for the staff, whether it be um, uh, based on this quarter, what I like to think of is based on this quarterly uh, activity, that we talked about earlier, right? The number of meetings, solicitations um, to incentivize it. Now, some people say, well, I don't know if if I we should do that or we should look at it. And I totally understand. One thing to note, it doesn't have to be substantial. It doesn't have to be through the roof. Um, I remember when I first was 500 a quarter, right? If I achieve something 500 a quarter, um, that's, yep, the next one, I don't know how I got there so quick. Uh, but, uh, you could offer activity bonuses uh, and it, it doesn't have to be substantial. It'd be 500 a quarter, right? 2000 a year. Um, what we, and one reason to do that is to say the job description that person had previously had uh, didn't have these associated with the role. Well, then what you could do is uh, this is a new way to re-engage or realign the uh, organizational priorities with this individual. Another way to do it is think of it, hey, well, we said the bare minimum was 10 meetings a month, but we believe that you could do 15 a month. Um, and so we could do something like, um, could you do 45, five, 45 a quarter? And so and you would get an activity bonus uh, once you hit 45 per quarter. You know, one organization I worked with, their mission was to uh, serve the poor. And the first, their first principle was to live like the poor. So they didn't believe in commission. And they didn't believe in bonuses, and I, I which I understand. Uh, but what we did was we got creative, and we did something fun that was a non-monetary um, uh, value, right? Where the uh, when the development officer hit his activity bonus, he was able to get free baby uh, date night with his wife, which included free babysitting for him, him and his uh, for his kids, and a gift card of his choosing to his his favorite restaurant. Well, that's pretty incredible, right? That that's a that's a token of gratitude for their hard work and something that they can aim for, um, and so so I really appreciate those. All right, true or false? Um, I or that you could even say your department feels comfortable giving out bonuses to the development staff. Great. 
Awesome. So 55%, well, roughly the same kind of we saw earlier, 55% of you said that you do feel comfortable um, giving out bonuses and 45% do not. And completely understand, um, you know, uh, both, I can see both sides of the story, right? And it depends ultimately in terms of the compensation structure of, of, uh, of how things are set up. So I'm not saying you have to, or this is exactly it, or if you don't do it, because uh, I recognize that there are differences uh, for things. So but please know um, I'm, uh, uh, I'm open to be being disagreed with. Uh, so, but by and large, this is what we see. All right. The third would be to develop engagement plans for your top 10 donors. Uh, you know, a lot of times organizations tend to think, well, um, you know, I, that's just so inauthentic, right? Some of the groups that I work with, it's kind of inauthentic to offer, um, to, to build out engagement plans for our top 10 donors. Uh, the story that I love is, so I'm originally from Louisiana, I'm from a small country town, and uh, my grandmother had 12 kids, and on, when her 12th was on the way, her husband unfortunately was struck and killed by a train. And uh, those 12 kids went on to have 50 grandkids, and those 50 grandkids went on to have God knows how many great grandkids. But what was amazing is every single month, uh, if it was your birthday or anniversary, uh, you got a card from her and you got like five bucks because there's too much money to go because <laughs> she had so many kids. Uh, but the sentiment was there that you received a card and we always thought, man, she's so amazing. How does she remember every single one? And I can't believe she does it so well. But when she passed away, we're going through her drawers and we found a stack of paper that had listed out month by month and by date and whose birthday and anniversary it was. And what we realized was that didn't make her any less authentic. In fact, in my opinion, it, it made me appreciate her more because she was so attentive to wanting to make sure that no one fell through the cracks. And I think that's the way we want to see our donors. We're so incredibly grateful for them uh, that uh, we, um, we want to uh, honor them and we don't want them to slip through the cracks, right? Um, so additionally, what we also see on average uh, or, or ideally uh, that if you're going to raise uh, your, your objective anywhere between a quarter million dollars to uh, $10 million or, or even more, that ideally your top gift, your lead gift is coming in from around 20 to 25% of the overall goal. And your top 10 gifts make up 55 to 65% of your overall goal. Um, I'm working with a client right now. They're uh, raising about 700000 um, and their top uh, gift is only 30,000, right? Far well and below that, right? Well, say we can't, and they want to get to a million, say uh, in the next year, we can't even close a gift for a quarter million. I feel very strongly we close a gift for 100,000. And I believe based on their portfolio, we could close two gifts for 50,000. Well, even if we're not striving that 25% and the 55% of the top 10, uh, we're far outperforming and we'll get even that much closer to a million dollars. Uh, then uh, how do we uh, not having those action plans for a top 10, right? Being very, very mindful of these people. So what we want to look at is we want to get to know the donor, right? When we're developing engagement plans for our top 10 donors, uh, we want to know uh, what's, uh, what do we know about this donor personally, professionally, uh, and what's their intent with our organization? What do they love about our organization? What really inspires them? Um, key note, uh, don't ask donors for capital uh, needs when they don't like capital needs, or don't invite them to sponsor your gala if they hate going to galas. It sounds so trivial and it happens all the time, right? So we want to get really get to know these individuals on a deep level. And when and how will you cultivate your relationship with them, right? How will we grow them and move them closer, right? Going to the giving formula, it's capacity times gender times affinity times emotional engagement. It's up to us to uncover capacity and affinity and us to, to drive them closer uh, to our organization. And then who will make the ask and how will we make the ask? Who will be present in the meeting and how will we do that? Um, and so what I like to think about is uh, there was this uh, great study called Science for Good and uh, which was kind of a um, uh, more of a detailed analysis of, of why people give. 
And then there was a, another uh, anecdotally one put together by Jerry Panis, who's kind of the grandfather of fundraising. And ultimately what they said was uh, that the three things that move donors is the belief in its mission, uh, the leadership of the organization, but ultimately relationship. And so I think that if what, what, when we're putting together moves for people to move them closer to the organization, we want to focus on experiences, right? Whether they can come to a conference or come to a talk or uh, come to be a part of something greater than themselves. Can they all, can we also in that foster relationship and friendships with people on our board or key, uh, key staff members or leadership? Uh, and, um, what was the third one? The oh, and a belief in its mission. I think that's that will be uh, determined when they get to see the mission firsthand. If we can make the mission uh, appeal to them, um, kind of firsthand knowledge, typically through conferences, right? So a sample donor engagement plan might look something like this, right? That they come to, and that's after you've already uh, downloaded uh, with your CDO. Okay, who this person is, what do they like? But it, it could look something like this: where that November they come to the Thanksgiving event. They followed up with a personalized holiday card from the founder. And in January, we provide them an annual report with a personalized note. In February, an email check-in and also to ask for that meeting. And then you have the face-to-face -face meeting and you make the solicitation then. But you have, you've determined how much to ask for. And you, ideally, they said, hey, I want to talk about a gift, not year in, but because uh, uh, the timing with clients is, is, is tremendous. And so I really need to capitalize and focus on that in Q1 of next year. Well, great. We're going to honor them by setting that meeting in March of the next year. So the fourth thing, right, is conducting face-to-face -face research. Time and time again, our clients come to us and saying, okay, how do we get to know all of these people and what uh, AI function can we use and what's some research platforms that we should use? And you can use all those and they're great, right? But they tell you only so much because there are still things that you don't know until you get to know the prospect. Um, the first thing to note about these people are they are philanthropists. They are major donors. They uniquely identify to that reality. And so to not talk to them about their philanthropy would not honor them, right? If you think about one of your unique identities about who, who you are, right? I love football, right? So I, it would be weird to me if people know me that know that I love football and say, hey, you're a really nice guy, but I just never really want to talk to you about football. That would, you know, that that would not come across well for me. Right? So we have to honor these people by philanthropists. A friend of mine uh, once said that when he was early on in his career, he said, if you ask people how they like to give, when they like to give, and what they like to give to, they'll tell you. And he said, I thought that was the, the stupidest thing in the world, and I was never going to do it until I realized it worked. And it's true if you just have that conversation with them. What I constantly tell the guys who report to me is to ask the golden questions. What are the golden questions? They are, what is your biggest hope for fill in the blank? That would be a very uh, strong affinity question. What's your biggest hope for society? What's your biggest hope for our mission? What's your biggest hope for the church, for the family? It's a very strong affinity question, getting to know them. The second, and most people like that question. It's a fun question. You get to know the donor. Oh, that's great. You share a commonality. You know, I'm curious to your philanthropy, what are your top three to five organizations that you support? Right? What? Oh, that's great. Oh, that's amazing. A lot of times you might have collaborations with those, those uh, other nonprofits or you personally might support them and you can build them up. Um, but then you can ask a great follow-up question like, you know, what, what would it, uh, would you ever consider putting us in your top three? And what would it take? Now, another follow-up question, if you are in the top three, you're going to say, wow, that's incredible that you've been supporting us for this long when we're in your top three. I don't know if you've ever considered uh, leaving us as a part of your, your estate plans. Have you ever considered that? Right? So you, it's a naturally tee up to a plan giving conversation. Uh, and then asking what would it take is to say, what, what is it that you want to see from our organization to prove to you that we're meritorious of that generosity? Um, you know, a lot of times people will ask those first two questions and they like those and they're fine with that. Very rarely do they ask this question, which I think is very uh, important if you want to. Uh, uh, in fact, leaving this question out, I would say you, uh, there are a lot of pitfalls you could suffer without asking this question. And I would tee it up something like this. 
You know, I'm curious, you're, you're, you've been very generous uh, here in Denver and to a number of nonprofits. Um, but, I, and I would love the opportunity to ask you for a gift, but I'm curious, how much do you typically give away per year? And stop, stop talking and just see how they respond. You can also say, you know, I, I love the opportunity to ask you for a gift, but I'd hate to over ask you. What you want to do with that number is to take that number and recognize that the top three are getting the lion's share of his generosity. They're getting something like 20 to 25%, uh, right? His top three are getting 20, 25%. And the last, uh, the, the other 25% are split out between a number of nonprofits. So if he says, I give all the way 100,000 a year and uh, you're a new organization, you, know, you can ask for 5,000. No, I wouldn't ask for 10. I definitely wouldn't ask for 25,000. That'd be way too much for this donor, especially for a first time gift. Um, and then, and then if, if there's any pushback with that question, you just want to follow on to a relationship. You know, I'm a professional in this organization, uh, professional in my career, and, and I have the hard reality of talking about money. It's, it's, it's challenging. And, uh, you know, I would just would hate to over, uh, to over ask you and to damage our relationship because I really appreciate you, not only your generosity to our organization, but your, your friendship and your leadership. Now, I think those questions are really good uh, on the front end as you're getting to know someone. And over time, when you want to ask for their most sacrificial gift, say you're wanting to ask for a lead gift for a campaign, or you want to ask for a leadership level gift, you want to ask something like, uh, and you want to tee it up with uh, praise. You want to honor this donor. You know, Jim, um, you would have to be living on a rock to not know what you've done for Denver and to all the charities here in Denver. You've been so incredible. You know, I, I'm curious, out of all the gifts that you've ever given, um, what has been your largest gift you've ever given? There's got to be a story there. And get them to talk about their generosity. The reality is you can't have friends over and say, hey, Jim, what did you do this past weekend? Oh, I endowed a hospital wing. with, And you can't do that without sounding so uh, uh, braggadocious, if you will, for lack of a better word, right? So typically the only people that they share their generosity and their most meaningful gifts ever with are their spouse and a development director and maybe the CEO. Other than that, no one really knows. And not that they're wanting to share in some sense of, of uh, pride, but there's a bit of, right, that there's this human experience that they live through and they're, they're proud of to do. Um, one donor actually uh, called me after I left an organization and he said, hey, I just wanna let you know, you asked me that question, and I didn't have an answer for you. And it unsettled me. And I just want to let you know, I finally gave away $750,000 to one organization because I wanted to fulfill that, fulfill that question. I saw it as a challenge. Well, that's pretty, pretty incredible, right? That he, he even called me after I left the organization because he just wanted to share that, right? Then the last thing is ask for money. What you can always do, what you need to do is ask for the money. If you, if you don't have, if you don't ask, you won't have, right? You need to prepare for the ask, how much money, right? You wanna ask yourselves, is the right organization, is the right project, is the right timing, is the right amount, and is the right person to ask? You wanna pra practice by verbalizing the ask and saying some like, and practice with a friend. Because sometimes you, you can't ask for a million dollars and do it on the spot. You need to practice saying the words $1.5 million. So that way you don't uh, uh, jibber jabber with your jaw. And you want to push to closing the prospect's gift decision, right? You want to, ideally, you are uh, provided with a what we call an LOI, a letter of intent for that gift, uh, to, for that person to make that pledge. What you never want to do is go to close, uh, uh, go to follow up with the donor months later when they, they ask you to follow up, when they committed to something verbally and they said, oh, did I say 25,000? Well, that's why I sent in 10. Right. Because more often than not, if you get them to sign something, uh, they'll they'll honor that more than a verbal commitment. I think we have our last uh, polling question here. And while you're doing that, I'll uh, look at the Q&A. Our major gifts program is really strong with our top 20 donors. And I would say not only do we uh, uh, know them and, and they know that we know them and, and, and appreciate them, but also that they're giving it the highest capacity that we think they can give to true or false.
False. Okay, 58% of you said no. Well, this is your uh, impetus if you're uh, struggling with major gifts. Uh, to Hey, feel free to reach out to me. Happy to uh, have conversations with those, the, those teams and offer any help or advice or support we can. And if it's true, which is incredible, that's awesome. You I would say lean into that. Lean into your major gifts program. Maybe see this as an opportunity to invest in another aspect of development, right? Whether it be grants or foundation, uh, grants and foundations, direct mail, um, and other annual giving sites, which is great. We have a handful of questions here, which I, I uh, appreciate that I'll happily get to. Um, one of the, one of the first uh, someone responds responded with bonuses change the officer's intent of the meetings and conflicts with the AFP code of ethics. Thank you so much for for sending that in. I appreciate you were the the, the bold one who said that. Um, I would say uh, AFP code of ethics does not strike out bonuses. Actually, believe it or not, uh, the, what they strike out is uh, uh, the AFP code of ethics. For those who are not uh, are familiar, the Association of Fundraising Professionals code of ethics uh, strike out a percentage uh, base performance. So for every dollar I raise, I receive some percentage. Uh, I would say that's unethical because then you, you can't look at a donor and say, hey, we where did my million dollars go to? Well, the first 10% went to our development officer to close that gift, right? You're, you, you would have to, you can't say that without being unethical in that regard. Uh, but AF, I worked for an organization who, who strictly followed AFP code of ethics um, and were able to offer bonuses. So I really appreciate you saying that, Andy. I, I appreciate you bringing that up. Thank you. If uh, the next two questions uh, go together, if major donors believe in the mission of your organization, are they less likely to donate if the organization is temporarily financially struggling? Um, I would say uh, no. Uh, it, um, you know, you don't. You never really want to be in that position where you say, uh, uh, ideally, you're never in the the financial struggling position. But those things do happen, right? Sometimes we can get over leveraged in what we're doing programmatically and uh, kind of get over uh, ahead of our skis. I think the main thing is having the conversation with the donor, right? And and what's the narrative, right? And I, I don't know what the specifics are to your situation, but a lot of times uh, what donors are looking for is, well, did you learn from the experience and what, and, and if so, what? Well, we thought this was going to grow really well. We thought this was going to be a program we were able to invest in and actually receive enough uh, um uh, revenue uh, from the investment financially uh, from a from a different revenue stream that we're gonna uh, that it was gonna provide, but we found out that that was not the case, and here's why, or whatever that situation is. Um, all the more that we do need your support, so it, I think it depends on how you craft that narrative. I assume it's safe to say that donors could include women as well as men. Absolutely. I thank you, James, for bringing that question up. There is a great, uh, so often women are, are overlooked. Uh, there is a major donor in, uh, oh gosh, Wisconsin, I believe. Um, everyone would call his wife and ask for the husband. And I worked with a number of organizations who, there's, we just cannot close a gift from them. Like, dude, you sound like such a jerk. You keep calling uh, and saying, hey, thanks for answering the phone. Can you put me on to your husband? The only orga organization I know of who closed a gift from that family they, they honor the, the spouse and said, hey, we'd love the opportunity to have you out here and come visit us. And, and they didn't even touch the husband. So we want you if you're willing to come out. Well, of course, she brought her husband and then she closed a seven figure gift from that individual by honoring. Him. So so I 100 I percent can agree that goes back to if you engage me and don't talk about football. The most, what's most important to this person is a spouse or other people, right? Um, and that could be include single women in philanthropy, right? There, it, that's a uh, growing factor of single women in philanthropy. So, all right. Um, how do we handle protests from other members of a small staff who don't get the bonus of the development staff? Uh, so thank you for asking that question. Uh, would you say that those would be programmatic staff, meaning those on programs versus those on development or those within the development staff who aren't frontline fundraisers. I'll, I'll, I'll try to speak to both. Um, uh, one, I would say more, the, one of the reasons people do get in development is the opportunity to make more. Um, development officers are uh, uh, incentivized more than anyone else in the nonprofit sphere sphere because they are doing the hardest work, right? That if you look at the supply and demand curve, 
the demand for them is high uh, and the supply of quality uh, development professionals is really low, right? And so I would say uh, just being honest, right? Now, now the other good news is what I think this brings up is the compensation structure of your entire staff. I just visited with the firm yesterday. They said 80% of our employees are, if you look at them, are basically making minimum wage based on the hours that they're putting in. Well, that's terrible. We need to, we need to, and I'm not saying this is you who asked the question. What we want to build in is maybe we need to think more holistically in terms of staff care and staff engagement. Uh, and if we raise this whole lot of money, we can make a world-class investment in our staff, which means bringing up those, those, uh, those wages to market wage. I think that's really, really impactful. And then they see the development professionals as not an obstacle to what they're making, um, but a catalyst for what they can, can potentially make, right? I really like that as an example. Is it more difficult to raise funds in smaller towns compared to large cities? Great question, Christina, thank you. Uh, it's funny to me, I would say it depends on the mission. Right, while a large metro area has a lot more people to draw from, uh, sometimes uh, it's easier to raise money in smaller towns uh, because uh, there, frankly, there's pressure to right that that you don't often get in metro area cities, right? That you're able to kind of hide behind things. Uh, with with small towns, uh, right? If it's a, a a local community center, people will see who supported and who didn't. Um, and so I would, I would say both present unique challenges. There's not necessarily one that's harder than the other. Well, you guys asked some great questions. Are there any other questions out there? Yeah, thank you, Ben. You know, um, we have a few questions, um, but I was gonna ask other presenters to rejoin and uh, we have, quite a number of questions that came in for other presentations as well. So I will uh, follow up with those. And then um, I do have a couple questions for you <laughs> kind of towards the end. So um, let's see, see if uh, we'll have Colette. Colette, you do have a couple. I actually had one that came up um, in my conversation with an audit client just recently last week when we were talking about the energy incentive tax credits. But um, the client doesn't own their own facility. They will not be constructing their facility, but they are under a long-term lease. And they're thinking of leasehold improvements that potentially could fall under some of these incentives. So would leasehold improvements qualify because they're not an owner? That's a great question. So as long as you are the owner of the energy property, you are entitled to these incentives. So as through your leasehold improvements, as long as you are footing the bill, right, for those solar panels or the geothermal well or whatever it is, um, and you're going to hold on to it for five years, then though it's, it's yours. It's your incentive. Um, if your leasehold improvements are somehow reimbursed by the building or that's part of the rental agreement, um, you'll need to factor that. But that's very facts and specific. Um, you know, facts it that's based on the facts. And so as long as you own it, you're good to go. And then there is another question on any other benefits out there for not-for-profits. Um, I know you're kind of working in the energy space. I would say from the overall federal funding, obviously um, PPP loans are over, but the employee retention tax credits are still available. And the um Set of limitations on those for 2020 credits. You could still submit your application through April 15, 2024. For 2021 credits, you could still apply through April 15, 2025. So for those listeners who have not looked into that program, there is still time. There was a notice, though, that IRS just issued um, not too long ago that because of so many Fraudulent providers, unfortunately, out there, uh, they're taking a pause. It's not a pause on application. It's a pause on issuing checks, kind of a moratorium until they get through a lot of these applications and see who truly qualifies. But have you heard any other updates on the employee retention tax credit? I haven't received any updates um, regarding there. But, you know, if you do have a valid claim and you're working with 
um, you know, an accredited like accounting group to help you file for that, definitely go and apply. You don't want to not get in line um, because they haven't really extended the deadline for for their moratorium on on checks. So um, if if it if it's a valid claim, go ahead and and file. And then I'll say as far as any other incentives, um, you know, I haven't seen too many on the tax side where there are credits that are treated like rebates from a federal perspective. There could be additional um, state incentives or actual grants through the EPA and the DOE. Um, so just depending on what you're doing, like there's there's some grant money that's going to clean schools clean vehicle school buses, right? And so um, so there was a section of the IRA associated with that. Um, and so it just depends on what you're doing to figure out if there are other incentives outside of the credit rebate aspect or on you know where you're located from a state and local level. Got it, okay. Stephen, looks like there was an, another question that just came in from the audience. And other investment indices focused on benchmarking performances of SRI ESG investment vehicles. Great question. Um, so generally speaking, that's one of the big um, issues with ESG SRI investing. So there are now some specific socially responsible or kind of just generic ESG um, indexes offered through some of the major index providers, but there's no specific continuity amongst, you know, what, you know, regulating authority that says this is what needs to be included, this is what doesn't, right? So every index provider could be different, which means then the underlying investments, if you're tracking that index, could be different, right? So there's no, uh, again, kind of oversight in terms of def definitions that make it very clear as to, hey, this is something that would constitute an ESG focus. This is something that would, con you know, constitute socially responsible investing. So it makes it uh, a little more challenging and nuanced. And, and that's one of the complications behind actually implementing is that there's no uh, consistency really across the board. Thank you. And Ben, I think the next one came in for you, if you want to take that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Someone asked, uh, can you address the difficulty in finding development professionals uh, for a small organization with around a million dollar budget? Uh, with the super high cost of living. Uh, we have clients in San Francisco and LA and New York, uh, which is, this is a very common issue. I would say uh, a handful of things that I've seen done. Uh, one would be, you know, if they have someone who they know who can do development on a contract basis, uh, uh, who, who's nearby, you could do something like that where you get them can, uh, some type of training and you provide that training to them for, you know, so many hours per month. This is not a hard pitch or a hard sale, but we do fractional gift officer work for people. So for our clients, they can hire us for 10 to 20 hours a month. We have all the statewide registrations uh, for you, so you don't have to do anything for that. Uh, but additionally, the other thing that I thought was really cool is um, I've seen people do is, and, and this is more of a, uh, from a tax side, is, is offering loans from the uh, organization at a very, very low interest rate for people to, to purchase homes. So that I've, I've seen that done really well or people being creative. They they have friends who own uh, real estate and don't need the income or willing to substitute that income as a donation. So I think those are some of the neat things that you can do in being creative. You can, so essentially outsource or look for creative ways to, to bring, that, bring that down. Great. It looks like the next one's probably yours as well. Yeah, Sonia, I, I guess my big question is the nonprofit that's giving you money, is that a grant making organization or is it just, I, I've taken it's a grant making organization, like a foundation, correct? Yeah, let me read the question because I don't know if all the participants oh, get the question. You. So what if one of your biggest donors is also a not-for-profit and they have to cut back on giving because of issues with their bottom line? What's the best way to find another large donor? Um and the answer was no, it's another healthcare organization. Okay. Um, uh, what are we, uh, I would say sourcing new donors, uh, going back to it is uh, you need to, first I would look in your current donor file, right? What, who, who are, uh, who is supporting us? 
Uh, one of the things I would totally say you should do if you haven't done so is a wealth screen. You can go and purchase a wealth screen annually. They're in the tens of thousands. We do so many of them. We can get it to you for like uh, 25 cents a name. So like very, very low cost. I just had a client who did this uh, and they said, oh, we have no major donors. And they did a wealth screen. They found out someone who gave $100 two months ago uh, has a foundation with $5 million in assets. Okay, well, that's who we're going to go talk to next, right? So I would say uh, start looking within your current donor file who's someone you can grow. And ideally, we can start also then targeting and sourcing new uh, foundations and new high net worth individuals. I would say foundation directory is a great approach. We also offer that as a service. We can target those people for you uh, as well. So that's good. I think that answered that question. Um, another question for Colette. Is there a cap on the incentives that's available right now? So there is not. With the exception of that environmental justice allocation, right now, 48 and 45 are uncapped. So if you're investing or producing clean electricity, um, you're eligible to get these. So the money isn't going to run out. Um, as of right now, knock on wood. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll note we have an election coming up. Things could change. Um, but again, that would be on a prospective basis. Uh, very rarely do we see uh, incentives like these have a retroactive nature because, again, the administrative burden would be so severe uh, for the IRS to try and come back and claw that. So, um, so right now, if you have these in your plans, or you're working through those design plans, um, it's important to kind of take a look and, and make sure we have that beginning of construction really documented. Yeah, I heard, I think the estimate was like $1.2 trillion is gonna get given out or is that even going up? I The last I heard was about 2 trillion. So the CBO originally estimated that these, um, because there are a lot of production credits that are eight figures, um, when we get into the manufacturing side of things. Um, but they originally estimated around 375 billion and a whole bunch of banks are like, these are uncapped. When people figure it out, it's gonna be like 1.2 trillion. And then they keep estimating and revising those estimates. So the CBO was like, all right, we'll say 570, like 570 billion. And the banks were like, no, 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 1.7. And I heard on NPR about a couple of weeks ago that it was gonna be over 2 trillion. So. It's just, like I said, it's gonna keep going up as people identify and invest in these. And you know, really where the ROI on like solar really wasn't there, it was like 12 plus years. When you factor in these incentives and then your energy savings going forward, it cuts it down almost in half, right? So it really is, it's, it, they really wanted to encourage people to invest in a cleaner economy and, um, and people are doing it. So it's it's yeah. having the intended impact. Well, and let's say from the development side too, what we're seeing, I've been working with some of the clients where because they're thinking about the capital campaign and starting the capital campaign of how to incorporate this particular piece of it into, well, not only the budget, but even the campaign materials that they are taking uh, credit, they are looking into that. And some donors are getting really behind it because from even the ESG piece, right? The donors are interested in it. And so it kind of brings all the three prongs together from the development, from the um, from the tax side of things and the ESG um, donor intents so far. So, all right, well, thank you. Um, let's see, Stephen, one question that kind of keeps popping up, uh, I think that's interesting maybe for you to address is, is there a fee difference in using traditional investment strategies and then the customized, more mission aligned investment? If you could just touch a little bit on that. Yeah, happy to. And uh, yes, in short, there is. And I know we had a polling question and you know, one of the concerns was certainly higher fees as well as maybe underperformance. And, you know, those can certainly be related, right? Because generally the higher higher the fees, you know, the, the bigger headwind that has uh, to, to performance. So, of course, anything that's going to be more customized, that's going to involve more due diligence from the manager standpoint, um, 
that's going to effectively limit their universe of investable options is generally going to result in higher fees. And again, depending on whether it's a traditional investment like stocks or bonds or potentially an alternative investment, that fee differential can range. But I'd say generally, you know, probably on average, you know, 20 or 25 basis points um, in higher fees. Again, generally also going to depend on whether it's passive management or just you know, getting index exposure, you know, to the to the question earlier, or using active management um, in the space as well. Yeah, and um, Ben, I know you've touched this a little bit about um, potentially having a development director join part time, either through outsourcing or a, a just part time employee. Um, what, and you were mentioning like some of the measures were maybe 45 meetings a quarter, things like that. How would you scale it down to somebody who's part time? What would you recommend that person maybe focus on at first when they jump on board? That's a great question. I would say if, if the target is 45 a quarter for a full time person, which would be 160 hours per month, I would say you base it on how many hours a month that they can commit to and make that fractional difference, if you will. So I think that's probably the best. Yeah, but but if and I I talked about a number of ways to to prioritize it, but ultimately, what we see is what's going to be most important is number of meetings and number of meetings with an ask and number of new meet, uh, meetings with new prospects are the top three that you can't suffer from. So or separate from. And so when you were talking about wealth screening, what other tools are out there to even find donors to start with? Yeah, that's a great question. One of the one of the ones I would I would even backtrack would be a data append, right? So so often we receive donors and donor information comes to us uh, where we have, hey, we have in our groups all the time. They hey, we have all of these people, but all we have is an email address, or we have all of these people, but all we have is a home address or a cell phone. Um, if you're able to connect with me, we have a service. It's like seven cents a name or something silly, uh, where we can take that. Uh, uh, that email address and match it with the home address or match it with the cell phone or get their contact information. We call it data. We call that a data pin. So I think that's a really, really neat tool that you can use. Uh, one of my, one of our um, clients, they said that they ran a data pin and got everyone's uh, new uh, home addresses and that lifted response rates from their annual appeal in Q4 more than anything they've done before. So I would, I would highly encourage that as a first step. I also include wealth screens. I think those are just easy, easy tools to utilize. Another one that we're, we just launched is uh, using AI, artificial intelligence, to kind of to get to know your donors. That's a tool that we use, Moodle AI. We have a similar pricing, a couple cents per name or whatever it might be. Uh, but it, instead of, because the old way is, hey, tell us about us, tell us about yourself and doing a demographic survey. But now there's so much information online that we're able to take that AI and, and bundle it and see kind of, okay, this is your prospects. This is where they live. This is uh, this is their their interest. This is what they really like supporting. So stuff like that or some of the cool tools out there to use. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Thank you. And for everybody online, you know, if you're uh, looking for slides, uh, I think those will also be attached to an email that goes out with all of the contact information. There will be a survey at the end as well. Just ping us, ask us questions. All of our contact info is out there. And I think um, I might just want to wrap up with a couple more questions that came in. And, uh, and then let's see, one of them actually, a um, couple people asked, and maybe Colette, you could uh, just to reiterate this, but um, one person said, even though we are a not-for-profit and don't pay any income tax, are we still uh, able to receive this credit? And then there came a question from a member of the church to say, well, we don't even file then typically the 990 or the 990T, and how does that work? So maybe just a couple more words about monetizing the credit. Of course. So originally, these credits under the Inflation Reduction Act, the first draft was that everyone was going to be entitled to direct pay. Everyone was just going to get cash back, tax exempt or not. And um, and so through some handshake deals, it was 
It was really their direct pay for those tax exempt organizations. So as a qualified entity under 6417, if you want to get into it, um, you're entitled. If you don't, um, if you don't have an annual tax filing, and even if you do, um, I might I, I might have misspoke earlier, um, but it is you're looking at the 990T. It'd be a one-time filing that you would go and you'd go claim this refund, and it's a matter of having the right forms, the election statement, your registration information that from the IRS. But as a tax exempt organization, um, 6417 turns these credits into essentially a rebate. Right. So we spent the money, we put the property, it's up and working, and now we want to go and claim the amount that's owed to us. And so that's why that overall cost of, of these provisions keeps increasing because there's more and more organizations um, that typically have never cared right about tax credits are getting up to speed. We're seeing more and more take part in it. We've talked to water districts, school districts. Um, a whole slew of churches and various different religions. And so it's, you know, your typical nonprofit organization, um, just about anyone who's like working to expand, remodel, upgrade HVACs, um, you know, we're having those discussions and showing them like right now, like that's, that's the way it is. Those are the laws that are available to you for the next 10 years, as long as, again, you meet, you meet the check boxes within the provisions, um, you're entitled to those. So it's definitely something that um, I understand the hesitation because it's the tax world and you've never had to deal with it before, right? And so, um, but, but that's where um, making sure you're either accountant or, you know, we're happy to help walk you through this. We have three or four calls a day with organizations just that are like, what is this about? And why do I care about tax credits? So um, it really is an edge, you know, no one's really behind at this point. No one can file for them until we get to next year. So um, so it really is just getting everyone up to speed, see what they're doing. And then if there is an opportunity to go after them, helping them document, um, you know, to show that they're entitled to these dollars. Thank you. Yeah, Ben, Stephen, maybe a couple closing words uh, from you know, some key takeaways. Maybe Ben, if you could start. Yeah, uh, one thing that hits me is um, there was a group that I was working with, um, and and there was there's a uh, another organization that they know that that was raising a lot more money than them, and and most conversations they would be quick to tear that organization down, and oh, they're so you know they they have all these buckets of money. Uh, until I re uh, what I realized was I said, hey, you can tear down them all you want. But the reality is, is organizations who commit to doing the hard things consistently will reap the rewards. And so that's what I would encourage you for, for all those out there uh, watching. Uh, and if your development department is not doing that, encourage them to do the hard things, right? The hard things, talking to donors, setting meetings, setting, being accountable and transparent on those. Um, and then you will reap the rewards. It's just that simple. So. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Yeah, I'll just add, I think, again, um, you know, the, the thought of kind of aligning your nonprofits assets with uh, your, you know, your mission and goal ultimately is can be, you know, overwhelming to think about the different nuances, who it's going to impact who may advocate for it, who may be against it, right? There's a lot of different stakeholders at play. Ultimately, it's just making sure that it is integral and it really is important to your organization on a go forward basis. There's a lot of different ways to, to look at things um, as, as hopefully you guys have, have gathered and there's no best answer, right? It's always very customized to the particular organization. Um, and so I think it just fosters, you know, the, the conversation, you know, really understanding what's important, how could this have an impact uh, positively potentially on your organization? Could it increase uh, donor interest because you're doing something, you know, that, that they're interested in as well? So I think it's it, the goal is to use the assets to, again, ho hopefully further your mission, get better donor engagement, get better in community involvement if there is something um, specifically important to, to your local community um, and, and other key stakeholders. So Again, fostering the conversation and just, you know, will be willing to, to have some of these uh, more nuanced, difficult uh, discussions. 
Well, thank you, everybody. I think we've reached our time. I know that um, my mentioned that uh, the CPE certificates will be provided to all the attendees who met all the polling questions. There will be a survey. Please respond. Let us know um, if you have any ideas for future topics. We'd love to hear them as well. And thank you again for joining. And I'd like to thank the presenters for the hard work behind it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone.